TitleMatchNetwork.com. Welcome to another edition of the RF Video Shoot Interview Series. Today we're joined by a true legend in the sport of professional wrestling, Carlos Colon. Thanks for being here today with us. Thank you for having me. No problem. I want to talk about uh, your growing up. Um, I believe you were born in Santa Isabel on the uh, southern coast of Puerto Rico. And then you, uh, I guess, moved over to Brooklyn, New York with your parents. And uh, Manhattan. Manhattan? Yeah. When you were about 13, right? 13 years old, yes. So were you a wrestling fan growing up? Uh, yeah, when I came to yeah when I came to New York, I was thirteen then, and, and I started watching the, uh, Vince McMahon Senior's wrestling, and uh, that's when I became a fan. At age, 13? at age thirteen, yeah. Okay, so who were some of the guys that you uh, grew up watching on uh, WWE? Uh, Buddy Rogers, my idol. You know, the, uh, growing up, he was, he was my favorite wrestler. Uh, the Tolos Brothers, the Kangaroos. Skull Murphy, Bruce Bernard, uh, Carl, Carl Van Hess, uh, Cowboy Bob Ellis, Dory Dixon, Miguel Perez, and a whole bunch more. So you used to go to the uh, house shows in New York at all? Uh, at the Garden. I used to go once a month. Wow. Every four Mondays they go to the Garden. And I always made sure I, I got money to go and, and watch the so um, basically, at, at what age did you uh, say, hey, I want to do this, I want to become a professional wrestler? Is this something that you wanted to do from an early age? Yeah, at 13 and a half, I started training because uh, my brother went to school with a kid. that His father was a wrestler in Colombia, and he got him interested. And I used to go with him to watch uh, Barbaroja's gym. He's the one that trained uh, Pedro Morales and Victor Rivera. And he had a gym on 42nd Street. And a lot of the professional wrestlers used to go there and train. You know, with the weights. Right. And uh, Barbaroja had a school there as well, a wrestling school. And I, I started, I, I became a member of the school when I was 13 and a half. And you pretty much, I guess you paid your dues by helping clean up the place. That's yeah, I did, yeah, because a lot of time I didn't have the money to pay my, you know, my dues right. monthly. So I would help out, you know, cleaning the place and that. So at what age did you actually start training to be a wrestler? Was it early on? Uh, you know, with him, it was a very slow process. He didn't, you know, he didn't let you... Like nowadays, you see a kid uh, going to a wrestling school and in six months he's already uh, wrestling, you know, championship matches. Uh, with Barbaroja, he did it, you know, it was three months just lifting weights. And then there was another three months learning how to fall. And you did nothing but falls. You know, if he ever caught you trying to throw a drop kick or do things, you know, right. without... His supervision, you know, you get you get help. <laughs> right, exactly. For you, early on, taking the bumps and, and learning how to take bumps, was that more difficult for you than uh, learning the psychology of the business? I mean, no, the psychology is definitely the hardest part of the of the sport, really. Right. And nobody can teach you that. Only time. Right. It comes to time. So, were you ever discouraged at a young age uh, when you started taking bumps? Did you ever say to yourself, "Hey, maybe this isn't for me"? Or is this? Well, I had, with Robert Rojo, like he brought you up the hard way, and uh, I had my ankle broken once right and that put me out for about six months and you know i thought about it and and, and that's when i really decided that this is one this is what i wanted to do for the rest of my life right all right talk about your training uh, what was a typical week like for you when you started training well i used to go to junior high school at that time so i get out of school at three o'clock and then i would go over there by four and i wouldn't get home till about nine o'clock it was a four or five hour every day, and I, I enjoyed it. I wish it would, we had longer hours because, you know, I enjoyed it so much. Right, right. So how long was it uh, before you started actually wrestling your, your debut match as far as, like, training went? You trained for well, in, the, in that school with Barbaroa, he had, a, he, had, he had matches for the older guys, guys that knew how to wrestle then. And uh, he used to run them every Sunday. So it took me about a year. About a year, you know, I was 14, and I was... In, in, you know, participating in the weekly cars that he used to run. Would you consider him your mentor? Yeah, my mentor. Yeah, my, my everything. He's, okay. he's the best trainer res, you know, in wrestling that I've ever seen. And I believe your very first match, uh, your debut was uh, against Bobo Brazil? No, no, Hobo. Hobo? At that time, uh, Tony Santos Promotions in Boston. Okay. Uh, they used to run, and, and Jack Pfeffer was his partner. So he liked to copy everything Vince McMahon did up in New York. Right. So they had a Bruno Sam Nartino. Instead of Sam Martino, it was Sam Nartino. Huh. His real name was Pancho Rosario. Wow. And I was Prince Cucuya. Because at the time, Vince had a big, you know, 
Curtis Hayakia? Right. He was in New York, so he he called me Prince Kukuya. It was a Hawaiian gimmick, right? Uh, yeah. It was an islander, you know, more like Jamaica, but the name was uh, na- it was named after Ikea. Okay. Now, from uh, that period of time, you worked a lot of other independent shows or companies. What are some of the other companies? No, they weren't, they weren't like now. Like, uh, I only worked for him because he was very strict. You know, if you were one of his students, you couldn't be running around, you know, wrestling for these outlaw promoters. Okay. So I stayed there till I went to Boston and broke in at 17 for Tony Santos. Okay. And then eventually you moved to Canada, to Montreal. Uh, Montreal, yeah, in 79, I went to Montreal. Is that where you met your uh, wife, Nancy? Or? Yeah, my wife, yeah, I met her there. Did you work at all in any of the territories of Canada? I know you worked yeah, for, 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 for in and out for five years. I want to talk about that coming up, definitely. So, um, And then you, you regularly worked for WWF in 1968 and 69 as a lower card guy, correct? Yeah, yeah the TV uh, guy. Right, you worked with uh, Johnny Rods? Johnny Rods, Pete, Pete Sanchez. Sanchez. What are some of your memories about uh, working those guys? Thomas Married. oh, great, yeah, great, great guys, yeah. Memories of uh, Gorilla Monsoon. Monsoon too. He helped with a lot. I used to wrestle him a lot in handicap matches. Easy to get along with outside the ring? Yeah, he was a good guy. Yeah. Obviously, later on friends. down the line, he became partners. Yeah, partners, partners and good friends, yeah. We'll talk about that coming up. What are some of your memories of, uh, your early memories of uh, Lou Albano? Oh, Albano, he was, he was a great guy too. He was crazy. Uh, I love Lou. Big time uh, partier outside the ring? Yeah, we traveled a lot because, you know, I didn't have a car, so. Uh, we traveled with Arnold Scotland to Washington D.C. every Thursday for TV. Right. And Lou Albano was always along. drinking and stuff like that. Yeah. Is so when true? we come back, he always get a six, you know, twelve pack of beer, and he was, he was a party guy. Now around this period of time for WWWF, when you were working in that territory in you know the late '60s, what are some of the territories like? Where on the East Coast would you uh, work? What What are some of the towns? Uh, for for the WWE? For, yeah, for WWF. Besides oh, New York. Uh, Boston, uh, all over Jersey. You know, Pennsylvania, Scranton. Right. Allentown, Hamburg, uh, Maryland. We used to go to uh, Baltimore and Manassas, Virginia, Bangor, Maine, Augusta, Maine, Portland, Maine, all those towns, Springfield, Mass. Any uh, towns stick out as being uh, some of your favorites to go to early on? No, my favorite was the garden. The garden? That, that, that was a bit spade in. Right. <laughs> what was it like working uh, the garden for the very first time for you, being that it's one of the, you know, the mecca? Oh, it was a dream come true. That's 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 a dream for most athletes. Right, you know, right. For boxers, basketball players, you know. That's the most famous arena in the world. Were you nervous first time going yeah, in? Yeah, yeah, very nervous, yeah. What are your memories about Barry McGill Sucluna? I had great matches with him. I learned a lot from him. Good guy. The original Sheik? Memories of uh, the original Ed Farhard? Ed Farhard, I, I didn't wrestle him much, you know, maybe once or twice in New York when he came in to wrestle Bruno. I, I, I wrestled him on TV a couple of times. Easy to get along with? Uh, yeah, he was, his matches, the matches with him were very short. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Killer Kowalski, you worked uh, with Killer uh, Kowalski. Yeah, a great, a great uh, in-ring performer. One of the best villains I ever worked against and I ever seen. Thunderbolt uh, Patterson, you worked with uh, Thunderbolt. Very talented young fellow. Good guy. Yeah. What was uh like working for Vince McMahon Senior? Oh, he was general. He was a very very nice person to work for. And he was straight. You know, he he always tell you the truth. You know, if he didn't have anything for you, he'd tell you. Right. Yeah. You know, just give you the handshake with the money, too, at the end of the night, right? Yeah, yeah. The Vince McMahon handshake. Vic, yeah. He's <laughs> one no. of the true gentlemen in the business. Did you know uh, Vince Jr. at the time when you were there? Or was he still coming up as the announcer at ringside? Or no, no. I, I, when, when he when he became involved in the business, I was already... You were gone. Puerto gone, Rico, yeah, in Puerto Rico, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess also, you, you, Pedro Morales was there. He joined the WWWF in 1970. Yeah, he also worked for us in Puerto Rico. Okay. Um, before that, when he, he got the big push as a, you know, I guess it was at the, uh, well, he became champion, obviously, at the Intercontinental Champion at one point. Do you think if you stayed in the WWF longer that you would have had his spot and maybe uh, been champion or? I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, I, I never thought of that because at that time, uh, the old man liked to feature Big Ben, you know? Right. And uh, I was 
five ten and a half, five eleven, uh, two hundred and thirty pounds. That wasn't very big at the time. What were your plans? I mean, for your goals at this period of time, did you? My goals is what what I, what I really became. You know, to become a a promoter in my own island, Puerto Rico. And, so you and knew I, that in the back of your mind that eventually you would want to. That's what to... I really hoped for. You know, and I. It was hard at the time because I didn't have the money, and to be a promoter anywhere, you need you need some money. Right. But thank God, you know, I was able to to fulfill that dream. Okay. We'll definitely talk about that coming up. Um, what was your opinion on Pedro Morales? Did you like him as a, as a worker? Or as a yeah, so I, I I was a fan of him, of his. You know, I, I like his work. So you always got along with him, and I got along with him. He's a tremendous person. Talk about uh, the very first time you met Abdul the Butcher. Would that be in Montreal? In Montreal, the first time. Yeah, we came to the church, or I was already there. Right. So he came up to my room and and, and he asked me. Uh, well, you know, everybody when you go to a new territory, you want to know what's going on, right? Who's here? And, and I and I, I told him, I told him, you know, everything he needed to know. What were your uh, impressions of him? Did you like him as a as a person? Uh, well, I, I always thought and still think that Abdullah one of, was one of the greatest drawing cards in in our sport. He's the only guy that could get over and, and fill an arena in, with two times on TV. Without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. And that, that, you know, when he was young, 40 years ago, well, you just bring him to your TV and, and you got to sell out at night if you have a show. Right, right. We'll talk about uh, Abby because you used him a lot down the islands. Coming up, we'll talk about him. Um, you also worked for uh, Stu Hart? Stu Hart, yes. I learned a lot with him. What are your memories of uh, Stu Hart? Oh, it was great. I, I love the territory, you know. Even though it was very cold and I come from, from a warm climate. Right. The Caribbean, but... There, it was just something about the territory that, you know, that you love. Right, right. And I would stay a year or two, and i leave, and I'd say, I'll, I'll never come back. And in six months, I was back there again. Hmm. What was Stu Hart like as a promoter? Let's, let's talk about Stu. Was he very tough? Or? No, well, if, 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 if you did you, your job and, and you work hard, he, he was very nice. He was very nice to me. I, I don't have anything bad to say about him. He paid me well. He treated me well. And he ran a good territory, you know. Did you have a good spot in his company when you were there? Yeah, I was on top there for five years. I was one of his main stars, as he called me. What are your memories of uh, his kids early on when they were just... Oh, I know them all. They were all good kids. They're all different, you know. Right. They're nice guys, yeah. What about his wife, uh, Helen? I, I never... I knew her. I met her a few times. But when I was there, you know, she, you didn't see much of her. Right. She stayed home most of the time. And I, I never went to the dungeon, you know. I never. I was okay. there five years. And I never went there except, you know, once in a while to, to meet him to go to Edmonton or some town. Right. Yeah. What were the uh, drives like uh, in Calgary? Because we've done interviews with guys in the past and they always talk about the long road trips. They were long trips, but they, I enjoyed them. It was, you know, good roads and we all had a six pack coming back, so it was fun, you know. Now, pretty much the, the drives there were really brutal because of the weather and stuff like that. Do you have Sometimes any the winter time was, was brutal, yeah, but. Is it true that sometimes you would have to drive over lakes that were frozen over to get different towns? I never had to do that. Okay. But we had to drive, you know, on roads that you couldn't see, you know. They call it whiteout. Right. Where, where the field on the road was all one, you didn't know where you were going. Oh, that's crazy. But I, I was always, I was lucky to always ride with uh, the booker, the late uh, Dave Rule. Okay. May God rest his soul. And he was one of the greatest drivers I've ever seen. Now, I was going to ask you about that. Uh, there's a story that goes around that you were driving, I believe, from Medicine Hat to uh, Saskatoon in October of 72. And I guess you felt sick or something like that. You wanted him to roll down the window. and No, it was it was from uh, Medicine Hat to Saskatoon, yeah. What exactly happened in that car ride? Well, it was, you know, we were, had a few beers and we got into an argument and, and, and you know, got a little fight and, and, and he, he fell and, and banged his head. And that was the end of his career. That was pretty much it. I regret that. Yeah, yeah, I was, you know, when I think about that, I feel bad. Did, um, I guess, did you guys make up after that or was it pretty much? No, I never saw him again after that, but I felt very bad and I wanted to see him to apologize, but I never had the opportunity. Now, I believe Abby was also up in Calgary and uh, yeah. you guys had your first series of bloody matches up there. It drew very well. Very well, yeah. What are your memories of uh, working with Abby in uh, Calgary? Stampede? Oh, great, yeah, because Abby was in his prime. He, was, he only weighed like 280. Right. And he moved like a cat. He could run uh, 
backwards, for, uh, faster than most guys can run forward. Did you see the potential in him? Did you think he was going to be a huge box office? Did you know right oh, away? Oh, he was, he was already in box office then, even then, you yeah. know. Right. It was a shame. I always told him that he never had the opportunity to work in New York. Because he would have set all records there, I'm telling you. Knowing the fans there. I grew up there, so I know how the fans are. Why do you think he never went to New York for business? I don't know. I don't know. You think politics? And Maybe. He didn't like to be controlled? or No, because he, he was easy. He worked for me, and, and you know. Right. Uh, you know, you don't have to control anybody. You can, you know, you can do business without controlling, you know, the wrestlers. Right, right. It seems to me Abby would have been a perfect fit in like the early '80s when Hogan was on top and oh, yeah. Abby and as the monster heel, and you know they you would have, have set all kinds of records, man, without a doubt. Really, because uh, and and he 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 regrets that too because Abby really wanted that was one of his dreams. That's I was I was happy when I saw him getting the Hall of Fame because that that meant a lot to him. Did he ever contact the office back then? WWE ever like or WWF back then? Did they ever contact Abby about coming in at all? Or no, no, he, he would have gone. He, if he would have went in a heartbeat. Yeah, if he would have heard that they were trying to get a hold of him, he would have driven there himself. Because that was his dream. He really he wanted to work the garden. Wow. Do you think he had a bad reputation in the business at all? For them I don't know. I don't know. Maybe somebody about mount him. I don't know. I really couldn't tell you. But they, 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 they miss an opportunity to make big money with him. Okay. Because um, he drew money wherever he went. It's not one place that... Right, exactly. He went that didn't draw money. Especially in Big Japan. Money. Right, in Japan as well, too. That's why in the Hall of Fame, uh, Cherry Funk talked about it. And he said, you know, wherever he went, he was box office. I'm going to talk about Abby more in, in depth, especially uh, for working for you down in, uh, in Puerto Rico. And I want to talk to you about other stuff regarding him as well coming up. Um, we'll talk about that coming up. Um, from there, after uh, Stu Hart's promotion, where did you go from there? Is that when you went to Puerto Rico and started up? Uh, from there, yeah, I came, yeah, yeah. I, I came to uh, Ontario for the Bear Man. You, you know, you, you know of him, right? Who is it again? The Bear Man. I'm not sure. Uh, Dave McKinley. No, go. you can tell. Definitely talk about it. Yeah, he used to run in the summertime around Toronto. You know, the Ontario province. Right. And uh, he used to use guys like Angelo Mosca, Bulldog Brower. Right. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, Angelo Mosca? Good memory. Yeah, good guy. Yeah. Good guy. Yeah. What about uh, Bulldog Brower? Yeah, he was a nice guy. So I got along with everybody in the business. I, I, I really can I don't have any one that I can say that I didn't get along with. No, I believe you, you met uh, Victor Jovica for the very first time in, in, in Calgary. Calgary. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, Victor? Well, he's still my partner. We've been right, in exactly. business together for almost 40 years. Wow, that's a long period. And he was the one that financed my dream. You know, I and, and I really appreciate what he did because he did, first of all, he didn't know me that well. He didn't know Puerto Rico, you know, he didn't know the language. Right. He was at my mercy, really, I, you know. He took all his money, all his savings. He sold all his properties and he came to someone with me and uh, he let me, you know, run the show. So let, let's talk about how the company started uh, Capital Sports Promotions. You had a vision, you had a dream and it's something that you wanted to do and, you know, start up a company in Puerto Rico. Now at this time, was there any other companies running the island at that time? No, at that time, no. Uh, Florida Championship Wrestling used to run there before. Right. But it had been a year, over a year, almost two years, that we didn't have any wrestling in the island. That's one of the reasons I, I decided to go then. Now, I believe when the, you were talking about the Florida promoter, his name was uh, Clarence. Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Graham. Oh, it was Eddie Graham who was running. Yeah, Eddie, yeah. Okay, okay, I know Eddie. I didn't know if, I have another name, Clarence uh, Luteral. I don't know if. Uh, Cowboy Lutro, you mean? They were yeah. partners. Okay, they were partners? Yeah. He yeah. was partners with Eddie? Eddie, yeah, he was blind, yeah. Okay. And uh, they were running there in the 60s, and they used a lot of NWA talent, I believe, right? But never used Puerto Rican wrestlers in a prominent role. And one or two, yeah. Okay. Well, we didn't have very many at the time, you know, that were professional enough to to be part of, you know, right. Florida Championship Wrestling. That was one of the best territories oh, yeah, in that. the world at the time. Did you ever work for Eddie at all? For a yeah, bit? in and out. I used to come to Puerto Rico and, and do matches for them a lot. Who'd you work when with? Dory Funk was booking? Right. When on the Lay Wahoo McDonald's was booking. Okay. What are your memories of uh, Eddie Graham? Because I a lot learned of people a lot. say he's probably one of the best finished guys in the business. Yeah, yeah, I learned a lot. I met him at his house about two or three times, and and, and every time I went, I, some, I learned a ton. What are some of the most valuable lessons that you've learned from Eddie Graham? Well, how to run the business, you know, like uh, he always believed in, you know, 
he didn't want a hot shot and, you know, just keep it basic. And, and it's true when you don't have all that crazy stuff, your territories last longer and, and, and you do better business for a longer period of time. Less is more basically or? Yeah, he was, he's, he's more basic kind of a guy, more wrestling holes. Right. Which is the name of the game. Now you had mentioned that you were down there when uh, Dory Funk Jr. was uh, booking, right? Yeah. What are your memories of uh, Dory Funk? Great. Yeah, Dory is one of the best technical wrestlers in the business. And then, you know, meetings with him and Eddie were, you know, a lot of the guys wish they could, they could spend an hour talking to those guys. So you would just pretty much sit back and, and take it all in? And I spent all day there with them, yeah. And even though I had my successful business at the time. Right. But, you know, it's never too late to learn. I learned more, you know, talking to those guys. Any other valuable lessons that you learned uh, from, from those, from Eddie Graham especially? Or? Uh, yeah, I learned a lot. You know, like I said, to, to, to run the business the way it sh should have been run. And, uh, you know, he had a lot of, a lot of common sense right. about, about life or everything, you know. When you came in for Eddie, did you work the loop or did you come in just for TVs? I, I do a couple of times. I go to, uh, I come in on Monday, do uh, West Palm, do the TV on Tuesday morning. Right. Work Tampa that afternoon, that evening, and do Miami and fly back from Miami, fly back to Puerto Rico. Okay. Now then Puerto Rico, um, you talked a little bit about, you know, teaming up with Victor Jovic and starting the company. How did Gorilla Monsoon uh, get involved as well? Because he, I believe he was your partner too. Yeah, he was. Yeah, we were friends from New York, and, and yeah. So basically, how did everything come together, like uh, to start up the company? You had the vision, and you had, you know, Victor had the money, and, and what was uh, Gorilla Monsoon's role in this? No, we just made. Him, he wanted to be part of our organization. We, we didn't need to sell anybody. We just wanted him to be with us because he, you know, he wanted to be part of it. Yeah. What what year did uh, it start? Nineteen seventy three, I believe. Seventy three, we started the company. Yeah. Who were some of the uh, early talents that you brought in to uh, start using at that point in time? Uh, we used mainly uh, guys that had the talent but never had the opportunity to work on top in anywhere. You know, like uh, Rick Martel's brother. Right. Michelle, Frenchie Martin. Okay. And they, they used to go as the Martel brothers. Pierre Martel and Michelle Martel. And uh, Gil Hayes from Calgary. Right. Uh, Dan Kane. He's from Detroit, you know. Al Costello, they were the kangaroos for us. Uh, Kurt Van Hess, he was from Canada. Right. A lot, a lot of the new guys that I worked with when I was on the road that I knew had the talent to to be on top, and, and I gave them the opportunity, and they drew big money for us. Now, did you have TV right away off the bat? Yeah, we had TV, yeah. Right yeah. off the bat? Because I always knew as a kid that you couldn't run this business without TV. Right, exactly. All right, well, what was the schedule like in Puerto Rico? How many days would you work? Uh, I know now it's like four days, Sunday to... There, there were times that we were running, like, in the summertime, two times a night, seven days a week. Wow. How are you we did that about two or three years. How, uh, but how usually we run, like, TV on Wednesday, and then we run towns Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, house shows. How were you drawing early on? Good, very good, yeah, big. We used to run twice on Sunday, so Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening. Wow. What was the typical crowd? Oh, we can go anywhere from 2,000 to 37,000 was the best one we ever had. What year was that? That was, I think, uh, 85, I think, if I'm not mistaken. It was uh, Bruce Brody and Stan Hansen versus Abdullah and myself. Okay. And me and Abdullah have been feuding for almost 15 years, and then uh, I had this thing going with Brody and Hanson, and I couldn't beat him. I picked every partner I could think of, and nothing happened. So I figured, well, I better take a chance with Abby. So I flew over to San Antonio, where he was wrestling at the time, had a meeting with him, his manager. And uh, he agreed, and we brought the match to our anniversary in Puerto Rico, and we turned him away from the higher Bethlehem Stadium. That's amazing. Let's talk about the fans down there in Puerto Rico um, before we get more into the company itself. We've done interviews with a lot of guys that worked at Territory, and they said the fans down there, if you're a heel, you're in a lot of trouble because they riot, they throw batteries at you. Uh, how would you compare the fans in Puerto Rico to the ones that live here in the United States? Obviously, Puerto Rico is part of the United States, but... Uh. They, 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 they're they hot. They, they were very hot, you know, and they I, they they believe the sport, and, 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 and they would get behind a, 
their favorite wrestler, and if you were a heel and you did, you know, bad things, you know, they go after you. But we had good security, really. I mean, very rare uh, somebody got hurt from a fan, you know. Well, a, lot of, a lot of the guys like to exaggerate more to make themselves tougher. Right. But it was not as bad as it sounds, as they make it sound, you know. What was the worst thing that you've seen a, a fan do down in Puerto Rico? Well, they, they, they throw, a couple of them threw rocks sometimes, you know, a couple of times. But right. Our security made sure that, you know, they would search him and and somebody got out of hand, they'd take him out right away. I think the last time I was in Puerto Rico was in 2000. It was for Victor's uh, IWA. And uh, just the crowd heat was amazing. I mean, the fans yeah. still believe that it's, you know, a legit sport and, you know, they don't know that it's a work. Why, why do you think the magic is still safe and, and sacred in, in Puerto Rico and, and not like here in the States where... Well, it's, 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 it's not like that anymore. It's, you know, it's, it's a little bit like here. Right. Yeah, you not you don't see that those riots that you used to see years ago. Right, right. Okay. Let's talk about uh, Victor Quiones. When uh, how did Victor get involved within the company? I know he was the uh, godson of uh, Gorilla. No, he, like... he as a as a young kid, we 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 he was only fourteen. He, he worked for us, selling tickets. Right. And he learned a lot from us about the business, and that's how he you know he, was he, got, he got to to be a promoter. Yeah. Did you get along with Victor uh, yeah. early on? Yeah, I got along with him, yeah. Um, also, early on in WWC, uh, you feuded with uh, Gorilla Monsoon. He came in. Uh, yeah, we do big business, yeah. Er Ernie Ladd? Ernie Ladd, yeah. What are your memories of uh, Ernie Ladd? Good, good. They were all great guys, you know, to work with. Killer Carl uh, Krupp? Krupp. So, yeah, he was a little more, you know, uh, controversial, but we, we, we handled him. What is that? He was like, uh, I guess, like... He's uh, temperamental, you know, he, he would get mad for... With egos? Not so much ego, he's just crazy. <laughs> right. Also, uh, I believe... Eric I was, the Red, too, you know. Right. Eric the Red, yeah. I don't want to pronounce his uh, name wrong. Pampiro uh, Firpo? Firpo, yeah. Firpo, yeah. And then uh, Mongolian Stomper came but into the territory. Stomper, too, yeah. We had everybody. You know, the, we have some cards that, you know, I go through my old books. Right. And we have bigger names than anybody in the country at the time. Without a doubt. Yeah. All at the same time, the same night. Now, the Moon Dogs, we had uh, Andrew the Giant, we had Abdullah, we had uh, the Stomper that night, uh, Eddie Gilbert and his father, Tommy Gilbert. Tommy and Dutch Mantel. Savvy Vega. I mean, we're going to talk about all these guys coming up. So, um, I mean, everybody who's ever been a name in the business at one point in time have come to your you know company and, and worked for you. So, I mean, everybody's been through there. So. Yeah. Uh, how did you get involved with All Japan? I believe in 1979 you went over for uh, Baba. Through, through Abi. Abi. Abdullah got me the opportunity. What do you remember? That was a good experience, yeah. What are your memories of uh, Giant Baba? Good, good. Another guy too, an honorable man. Good promoter? Yeah, good promoter. What are your memories of uh, working with uh, Abby over there? You guys were a tag team. Yeah, one time. Just once? Yeah, one time. When you went over to Japan, um, you know, compared to working in Puerto Rico, because it's a lot stiffer style uh, in Japan. It's not, it's not so much stiffer. It's just that it's a different style. It's kind of like a go, 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 go. Not that much psychology to it, you know? Right. Were you it, like it's, a, it's not like Mexico, but it's different because Mexican wrestling is different than American wrestling. And even though Japan is not as aerial as the Mexican wrestling, but it's, it's more like a... Like go 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 type of wrestling. Were you able to get uh, accustomed to the style right away, or did yeah, it take I did. Some time yeah, it, it took a little time, but it, I, after the first week, I I got the groove of it. Now I believe when you went over there early on, you worked regularly with uh, Jumbo Sharuda and Mel Mascaris. Yeah. What are your memories about uh, Jumbo Sharuda? Good, good, good wrestler too. It's solid. What about uh, Mel Mascaris? Good, good. Yeah, he, he he was he he mixed the red Mexican style with the American. It's good. Now a lot of people that we talked to said that he might have had an ego. Um, do you think he was an egomaniac at all? No, no, no. I don't know. He 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 was a talented guy, and 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 he knew it, you know. And he didn't let anybody, you know, put him down. So if that's being an egomaniac, then right, yes. <laughs> right. Now you also worked with uh, Giant Baba, I believe, too. Yeah. Right? I worked with everybody there because I, I was there several times, trips. And in those days, the tours were like the shortest one was three weeks. Wow. So I was there four weeks twice, and then one time I was there three weeks. Any good uh, road stories from all Japan? 
Oh yeah, I had a lot of fun there because you know it gave me a break from my business. Right. Uh, it gave me a chance to be one of the boys again for four weeks. Yeah, I was going to ask you, it, yeah. who would, would you guys stop promoting shows in Puerto Rico at all? Or no, no, they kept going. No, we, we had a good we, we had a good company, and uh, I was not the only star. We had the Invaders there that were hot. We had uh, Eddie Gilbert was hot at one time, and we all had some American baby faces that were on top. Who, who was your booker early on uh, in the 70s? Who was your main booker? Was it you? Well, I was always the booker, really. Right. I had guys, you know, working in the dressing room to keep the, the discipline and stuff, but you know, we for creative it was yeah, much, it was more, uh, us, yeah. Okay, um, let's talk about Mexico. You, you mentioned uh, Mil Mascaris, obviously uh, one of the top Mexican stars. You, I think you went down there in 1982, and, and you worked uh, at least one match in Mexico, right? I worked few matches there. I worked with uh, Canek, right? I worked with Pedro Aguayo, El Santo, El Santo. No, El Santo. I worked with him in Puerto Rico as, as his partner. Okay, they filmed a movie. He was filming a movie, Noche de San Juan. And uh, in that, inside the movie, they had that one match, which was uh, him and I as a team against uh, Barabas, who was our main, one of our main heels, and Rebelde Rojo. That was the guy that I was wrestling in Mexico. Right. Um, the Mexican style of Lucha Libre, were you able to get accustomed to it the very first time you went over to uh, uh, It took me like, like Japan, you know, a couple of times. Because the tag team, they do a lot of tag teams over there, and, and they there you don't them. tag. You just gotta know when to come in and when to get out. Right, right. And that was a little confusing at first, but I got, I got, I got, I got used to it. Do you think that style could get over in Puerto Rico, the lucha style, or do you think? See, it's the when we, when, when we started our company, the one thing I always wanted to do is to uh, mix the Mexican wrestling, you know, for their moves, fancy moves, the acrobatics. And the American style of wrestling for the timing, the psychology, and right, and we had great success doing that. That's why we're a little, we're a little faster than the Americans, but a little slower than the Mexicans. <laughs> you guys definitely. It's a, it's a good style, you yeah. know. Right. And it was easy for the American guys when they come over to adapt to our style. What are your memories of uh, El Canek? Good, good, big guy for for a Mexican at that time. He was big and good performer. When you went to Mexico, how long were your tours there for? No, I was just going for a, a shots. night or two and get out. But I did that a few times. Now, I believe, I don't know what year this was, uh, WWC was eventually invited to join the NWA. Uh, and then you no, had, we were part of the NWA for years. Right. Until you, until it closed. So you had you had access to a lot of the top guys. Like yeah, we were, come in we, we, had, we were pretty powerful there. Uh, my partner was a member of the board of directors for many years. What are your memories of uh, Ric Flair when he would come into the territory? Yeah, he would do big business. All, all the champions, the NW champions, when they come in, they, they do big for us. So you guys had the big unification match, I believe it was in January of 83. But uh, for whatever reason, the match never aired outside of Puerto Rico. It was never really officially recognized as a title change by the NWA. What were the politics behind this? It was no politics. It was just uh, we wanted to have our own champion, and, and uh, we had a... Our world WWC champion, right? And then Ric Flair was the NWA champion, and we wanted to create a different title, like the Universal title, and that's how it was born. We had a match, Flair and I, a unification match, and I, I I beat him for that. And then I became the Universal champion, and we did away with the world title, and then we used the Universal title, and not still today. The title is still going. So it started from that match pretty much. For that match, yeah. Let's talk about Ric Flair. Was he easy to do business with when he came into the territory? Or? Yeah, he was easy, yeah. Rick is a good guy. He's a good friend too, you know. We, right. Besides, you know, we're good friends. So that... Easy to work with in the ring? Easy to work with, easy to do business with. It's easy. What's he like outside the ring? Uh, he's a party guy, you right, know. Exactly. Like he is. <laughs> what you see is what you get with him. Real life gimmicks a shoot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, uh, Ed Barhat came in, the original Sheik, I believe, in 1982, worked the territory for a Yeah, year. he worked. He did business, too, yeah. Good business. Okay. Now, you're, you're feud with Abdul the Butcher to this day. You know, you watch the videotapes. It's probably one of the most legendary feuds of all time in, in WWC. I remember watching it as a fan myself and, and getting the videotapes and, you know, rewinding some of the stuff you guys did. I think not only WWC, I think around the world because I go to many places, you know, different countries, and they talk about it. 
you guys know about it. Yeah, you guys pretty much had some of the biggest drawing gates because of that match. Yeah. Um, you guys would have death matches and uh, brawl over the building, barbed wire matches, chain matches. What are, uh, I guess, some of the memorable matches that stick out in, in your feud with Abby? What are some of the matches that you remember the most? Uh, what barbed wire matches, man? I had a few of them. They, they were unforgettable. Easy to work? or yeah, Easy, yeah. Barbed yeah, but you have, to, you have to be in shape to work Abby because he... He was on your ass, I mean, if you didn't, you know, if you fall asleep, he eat you up. <laughs> Memories of the uh, famous angle where Abby blinded you with a... Yeah, that was the biggest house we ever drew. Pneumonia. Singles, you know. Right. Going against each other, yeah. I was out for six weeks, and when I came back, we sold out the Beethoven again, you know, people all over. The we had about 15,000 people on the ground. Wow. And all the stands were full. Now, what do you think about the most recent news with Abdullah Butcher testing positive for hepatitis C? Do you, do you think uh, it's true, or what are your thoughts on the whole entire situation? I don't know. I don't know. It's a very sad thing, you know, think that that should never happen because, you know, if it's true that they have it, you know, how do you tell who gave it to who? Right. You have know? you ever been tested for it at all? Or? No, I'm fine. I don't have it. Oh, okay. I mean, did yeah. you, when you heard the story, did you get tested, or did you get tested before? Before, yeah. Okay. Have, uh, I guess, you know, in Puerto Rico, the style is, is so violent and, you know, we'll talk about blading and stuff like that. Has it ever caused you to reevaluate, I guess, the practice of blading at all? Did you ever say, all right, maybe we should do less blood now with all the dangers out there with uh, diseases or? Well, we never, in our territory, there's not that much blood. Not anymore. Even, even then it was not, you know, it was, it's less now, but. Right. Even then it was not like people say like every night, no. Um, you know, the big story is with that kid, Devin Nicholson, uh, the Canadian wrestler, suing Abby for giving him the disease, allegedly. Um, he also worked for you down uh, in Puerto Rico. Yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts on him as, as a worker and as a person? I mean, he's a nice kid. He's kind of quiet, awful quiet. You know? Right. But he was a decent worker? Yeah, Irish, yeah. He, he claims, I don't know how true it is again, um, he said that he didn't know that Abby, you know, he didn't give Abby permission to blade him. Um, do you, did you ever know Abby to blade somebody without, you know, one of the workers giving permission? I never heard of it, that before. All right. Um, now you guys really shifted towards, I guess it was the late eighties, a, a very violent, you know, style of professional wrestling. What did you think about, uh, you know, Victor was with you guys and, uh, I would say Victor maybe looked up to you as, as, you know, you might've been a Victor's mentor. Uh, what do you think about Victor going over to Japan and starting up the wing promotion and obviously Anita, Anita, sorry starting up uh, the FMW promotion in Japan using your style. Did you, uh, what, did, what were your thoughts on that? I never gave much thought because I didn't know much of it. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I heard they had a little company there, but I didn't know, I didn't have details. Right. Uh, how also, they run it. didn't really interfere with your business either. No, 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 no. What, and we always dealt with the big ones there, Baba and Inoki and International when they had it. Right. Mr. Uh, Yoshihara. Okay. Now, Eddie Gilbert, when he came into your company, you know, he was there in the early 90s, and eventually he became booker for ECW. And uh, Paul Heyman, you know, started ECW as well, taking over uh, for Eddie as, as the booker. What did you think of the uh, modern-day uh, hardcore wrestling in uh, ECW? The use of uh, the tables, the ladders, chairs, glass, and the thumbtacks. You, you guys pretty much done a lot of that early on. Yeah, well, we didn't over you didn't overdo do it, it like they're doing it. And, right. and, well, they do it, you know, they're killing it because now they see one table, they see two tables, they see... I don't mean anything. You guys did it. At first, it, you know, it, it was like a an eye opener. But now that they've seen it so much, I don't think it means much. Right, right. All right, well, let's talk about. Um, well, did you watch ECW when it first came on at all? I watched a few, a few, a few, a few, a few uh, episodes, but not, not to, it's not my my thing, you know. It was you weren't into the product. No, no. Um, going back to the fans, you know, with the reputation of violence, is it true that several foreign wrestlers demanded increased security measures? Like, uh, I guess after the, after, I believe Brody was even attacked by a fan one time with a with a knife, and um, seats were removed. I guess further from the ring. Who? Uh, the fans when they attacked Brody with a knife at one point in time. No, that's not true. Never. Okay. No, not never. That I, that I, I, I didn't know if that was true as far as like uh, the, the seats being pushed back further. No, 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 no. We never had to take this measure. Okay. It was not, they make it, like I said, they make it sound worse later than it really was, but right. it wasn't that bad. Any uh, stories from working exotic locations such as uh, Dominican Republic at all? Or, or Trinidad or the Virgin Islands? Yeah, we still, we, we have our 
TV program in Trinidad still. And our plans is to reopen that area again. We were there before and we were very successful. We drew some big, big crowds in Trinidad. You had the big riot, I think, over uh, there in the early 80s with Abby. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that. Where and the fans there were a lot harder than they were in Puerto Rico. The other thing, right. people don't hear much of that, about that. But what are your memories of the, uh, the riot that happened over there in Trinidad? Were you nervous uh, with the armed soldiers at all? No, they, they, it was not really right. It's they, they just that the security there, they, they wear that that kind of uniform. And right. It looked like uh, army people. They're not. Okay. Obviously, you were married to uh, Abby for a long time. You guys had a huge program together, and eventually it spilled over to the NWA in the States uh, for Starkey in 83. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, facing Abby at uh, the Greensboro show, Starkey 83? It was a great experience because uh, I didn't know that that few had that much interest, you know, in the state. Right. And when I got in the ring and, and I hit Abby, I mean, that place became uh, unglued. Did you ever at uh, any point in time want to want to come back to the States full time and uh, work here after, you know, working for the NWA in the early 83 or 84? Or was you just I, I, I wanted to, but I didn't have time because, you know, we're so busy running the Caribbean. Right. Not only, you know, four towns in Puerto Rico, then... Every every two weeks we go to Trinidad and run three towns there, Barbados and, and one in Barbados and, and two in Trinidad. Do you also work for uh, Joe Blanchard for Southwest yeah, Beach Wrestling? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did quite a few things. Who was uh, in that territory when you went down there? Was uh, it was uh, it was uh, t no Tully wasn't there. He had just left. Okay. Uh, the Shivers. Luke and Bush. Luke and Bush. They were running it. Right. And uh, Man Manny Manny Fernandez, Al Perez. Bob Sweetan was still there. No, Sweetan was still there. I think he came after or he was there before. Right. Uh, Alma Drill. Okay. Bobby I think crew, Bob, Bob, Bobby Jaggers, uh, Eric Embry, Bobby Fulton. Right. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, Bobby Jaggers? Who, you know, you played a big role in uh, in your company in Puerto Rico. Yeah, he worked a lot for us. We like Bobby. He's a good guy. Easy to work with? Easy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are your memories of uh, the Sheep Herders? Good. They 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 did big business for us. They had the uh, infamous, I believe. Who did they work? Uh, it was Invaders. The, uh, the Invaders, the yeah. Barbed wire match. Yeah, yeah, bar, yeah. They did a good business for you guys. Big business, yeah. Yeah. Are you um, surprised when they went to uh, the WWF and kind of like got rid of the gimmick and became the Bushwhackers when they were pretty much the most violent tag team in the business? And yeah. <laughs> I was happy for them. I mean, you know, it showed that you know they could get over. They can versatile. Yeah. Right. Okay. What are your memories of? Uh, I guess the boxer versus wrestler match with the late uh, Joe Fraser in 1984. Yeah, that was that was a good 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 angle. How, good, how did that what? come about? Uh, you mean the outcome? Yeah, no, I just how did the whole angle start? Well, I heard before in the past that you know that wrestler versus remember when Inoki fought uh, Ali? Yes, and that was a successful deal. So I figured, well, why not do it here? Then, you know, now. Right. In Puerto Rico, and, and we got in touch with uh, Fraser's people, and we did it, and it was great. He also refereed for us one of my matches in Trinidad. Is that the one with uh, you and Brody? No, no. Okay. It was me and Abby, I think. Okay. Well, I, I don't know. I have my notes that uh, one time you worked Brody, and I guess he was the referee, and I guess the finish called for Fraser punching Brody, who was apparently paranoid that he was going to get double-crossed or legit knocked out. I don't know if there's any truth. I don't remember. I, I didn't think it was Brody, but if you say it was. Yeah, I think, I think it was Brody? Yeah, that's what it's Okay. And he wrestled, he wrestled Jovica in, uh, he fought Jovica in Trinidad. Really? Yeah. How, how was that? It was good. <laughs> Box service was wrestling. When you, um, when you fought him, I believe the match only won about five rounds. When I fought who? Uh, when, when you fought Frazier. No, I never fought Frazier. You never, you never pinned him in a wrestling match? No, 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 oh, never, okay. no, 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 no. So who, who did I wasn't that crazy, yeah. uh, Who did he actually work? Was it he, he wore Victor in Trinidad, and he refereed one of my matches. I think it was Steve Strong and against me. Okay. And he was a, he was a referee. All right, uh, I got it mixed up. Was it was it hard to convince uh, Frazier to do the job in the match, or was he... Uh, well, he didn't do a job. He just... Right. He uh, ended in uh, a contest or something like that. Okay. I believe in uh, 1985, you also worked for uh, Pro Wrestling USA, which was uh, Vern Gagne and uh, NWA when they did the joint promotion deal. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, working for uh, Vern? 
Good. In NWA. Good. We always got along with everybody. Who are, who are some of the guys that were in the company when you were uh, for AWA? Wow. I don't remember. It's been so long. I don't. I don't. Right. Right. You also had an action figure come out. With Abby. Remco. Yeah. 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 I believe it was one of the first uh, action figures out there with, with you involved. So were you happy to see that? In the yeah, I was happy. I still, I still see it. Some fans bring it to me. Randy, Randy Savage also came into the company. I yeah. believe in 1984. Yeah, right just, before, just before he went to New York. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, good, with Randy? Good, good. Big business, sir. Yeah. What was he like outside the ring? Good, good. Good to work with. Good to, you know, to business with. Right. The whole family, you know, Lanny, his dad. They all worked for us at one time. Did he bring his wife down at all, Elizabeth? When, uh, no, no, there, that was so, before. I don't think they even knew each other. Then. Okay. No. I, all right. Um, another, well, you brought in a lot of guys, like we said earlier on, uh, especially from the NWA. Harley Race came in uh, to the territory, and uh, you worked with Harley. What are some of your memories of working with Harley Race? Good. A great professional. Terry and Dory Funk? Terry, yeah, for a long time. Yeah, big business. And, of course, Stan Hansen, uh, another guy you had tons of uh, matches, borough matches, and a lot of gimmick matches with in Puerto Rico. Uh, talk about Stan Hansen. What was he like to do business with? We well, easy, you know, no problem. Dick Murdoch? Good. Some he worked for us a few times. What are some of your uh, memories with uh, Dick Murdoch outside the ring? Good. He, he liked the beer. That's what everybody says. Yeah. We used to, he, he was a good barbecue guy, too. He had an apartment by the beach, and he'd bring the boys, you know, every week. Right. I have a big barbecue. I was there a few times. And good. What about uh, Tully Blanchard? Obviously, you met him in Southwest. Good, a good friend, yeah. I'm very happy that he's been inducted in the Hall of Fame this year. Ronnie he Gardner. It. Tremendous performer. And uh, Joe LaDuke also came into the yeah, company? He, yeah, he worked for us, so he, he did good business, sir. Out of all, all the guys that would come down uh, to work for you, who, I guess who's the one guy besides besides Abdul the Butcher that did really good business for you? Like, Other than that, it's hard because so many of them did business for so long, you know. It was so easy for us to get those guys over, you know. All well, the guys that I cannot mention, I, I cannot mention one that came down and didn't get over. What was your philosophy for bringing these guys in? Obviously, they're all like big monster heels. You had Stan Hansen, Bruiser Brody, and Abby. Was it pretty much, you know, you were the big baby face battling? Well, they had the size and, and the style. They, they, we made sure they were aggressive. Right. Like you said, you know, Hanson, Brody, Abby, they were all, you know, big rugged guys. And, and that's what you needed. Just put them on that TV and the fans were hungry for talent like that. When you would bring a, a Bruiser Brody, what were your plans as far as bringing him in? Like, a, or even a Stan Hansen when, when you first brought these guys in? What just, was... just build them like we did, you know? Right. And that way they can come in and out. For big shows and, and and we would always do big business with them, you know. What are your thoughts on Dutch Mantel? Because he was a uh, also a booker for you. Yeah, he's a great, great, good mind. Good mind for the business. He, I think he's underrated. I mean, a lot of big companies in the states don't give him the recognition that he deserves. I think he's one of the has one of the greatest minds in the business. What are some of the uh, I guess some of his ideas that really stick out in your mind that Dutch did for you, for your company? Some of the gimmicks that he came up. Well, with I don't want to go into it. But but he was he was very creative. Good guy. Yeah, good guy. Yeah. Out of all your bookers, who was your uh, favorite booker that you had uh, that you employed? Like I said, the only I always did the booking. It's just who's your? But the only one that really you know we had Luke of the Sheepherders. He did. He really. He was a real booker for for a year. Right. And Dutch too. He's the other one that really ran his stories. When uh, Luke and and I think Dutch. Dutch, I have a lot of respect for his, his, his way of thinking, you know, wrestling-wise. What are your early memories of uh, Bruiser Brody, the very first time you ever met Bruiser Brody? Good, good. You know, he was, he was a good guy. What was it like to work with him in, inside the ring? I was a little stiff, but he's good. You know, he wouldn't hurt you. Was he ever difficult behind the scenes at all? or? Well, no, not, not with me. I, I really never had any problem with him. Easy to get along with him. Yeah, he was. And obviously, he was good business for the company. Yeah, big business. Other than Abby, he was, he was the next. Right. Obviously, uh, we're going to talk about it. It's a big uh, story. What, what happened you know, with Bruiser Brody and uh, Jose Gonzalez and Invader number one in, in the locker room? Well, the I really wouldn't like to go into it because I, I don't know really much of it. The only thing I knew that they had differences before. I was going to ask you. I mean, did, did you know that uh, there was heat between the two before there 
incident? Did you know that there was like, you know, well, trouble brewing? Not really. I don't until it happened. You know, that's when all this things came out because neither right. one of them, you know, they worked together and everything was fine, you know. All right. I, if I, I knew that it was heat, I, I would have separated, separated them and stopped using one of them. Now, I've heard different stories. I'm going to just tell you what I heard. I know, yeah, yeah I know right. there was a million stories. I'll just, uh, I heard from, you know, Victor told me and a lot of the boys that we've done interviews with said. What, well, Victor Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I talked to Victor when I was in the islands a couple of times. And he had told me that back stemming back in the late, I guess, 70s, early 80s, when uh, Jose worked for WWWF as a job guy, that Brian, Frank would be there, or Bruiser Brody, and uh, he was a little bit too stiff with him, maybe took, uh, took him to the limits and didn't pay him respect. And then later on down the line, when... Uh, well, f first of all, if he told you that, he lied to you because Jose Invader was never a job guy for Vince. Right. He was a mid carter. Right, as the invaders when he yeah. came into the country. No, and before that, when, as a Jose Gonzalez, he was not a job guy. I was a job guy when I started in 68. Because, you know, I was 18. I was, you know, what you call a job guy is a guy that goes on TV. Right. But Jose was, you know, working all the house shows with the Samoans, with the, you know, Moondogs, and he was not a job guy. But I don't know about those differences. You know, I didn't know about that until until that incident. So, so that night, did you have you had no sense that there was ever any like no no the two oh no so? if I didn't. that's a you know I would have avoided it because right. you know you don't need that. I was going to ask you if if you knew that he was going to and our business you that heard of business big time. I was going to ask you. I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. Um, you were the very first person I believe on the scene after after the stabbing took place. And uh, is it true that Bruiser Brody's final words to you were pretty much to ask you know ask you to take care of his family? Not really. He, uh, I really, when, 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 when we went to the room that what happened had already happened, you know? Right. We just, I, I just helped him out and we put him on the floor and the doctor was there. Where were you? Uh, but I don't remember this word because, you know, I was so nervous, everybody, you know, I never seen anything like that in my life. Where were you before the actual incident happened? Were you, you were running the show or were you, uh, I was in the dressing room there. We were all there. All, all the boys were there. You were in the same dressing room as, yeah. as Brody or as, yeah. okay. as Brody. They, we were all there. The same room. What exactly did you hear? Anything or? No, they went, they went to the back, you know, shower. the shower. Right. And they had, a, they were talking like they used to talk all the time. So we never thought, you know, I never, I never thought that, you know, that thing was going to take place because. Right. I would have stopped it. When was the first time that you sensed trouble that night? When did you realize something just happened? When it happened, when the whole commotion, the thing. You actually heard the screaming or? Yeah, I heard it some, like, like a fight, you know? Right. Yeah, like a fight. And yeah. what happened after you heard the commotion? What did you do? Did we you... went in and my partner went in, Victor, and we separated them. And I didn't even know that he was hurt, you know, that until the doctor started. Oh, you, you saw, was Frank lying on the ground at this point in the shower bleeding? Or? No, no, he was not bleeding. No, they were standing there. We separated like you and this kid. Or right. Started fighting, you know, we just pulled him apart. When did you realize that uh, Brody had been stabbed? When the doctor came over. Did you realize how bad it was at first? I didn't know, no. Is it true that uh, Victor Dravica tried to have it, well, they engaged in a shoving match after uh, Jose stabbed him at all? or No, they don't, I don't know about that. All right. Somebody Victor said Dravica on sex. Uh, wasn't able to pretty much detain uh, Jose Gonzalez at all. So, what what happened with the uh, the ambulance? What, why did it take so long? It was like twenty five minutes, I guess, before the actual ambulance arrived. I don't know how long it was, but was I, don't, I don't think it was that long. Was really it took a little time, but not. I don't think twenty five minutes. When the paramedics first arrived, did they think it was an angle at all, or did they did they know? It was I don't know really. It's, you know, it's been so long ago, and so sad. I I really, you know, I. I wouldn't. I would want to talk about this anymore because it okay. makes just, you sad, you know. I just have a couple more questions, and we'll, we'll definitely move on. Um, did you ever want to cancel the show that night at all, or did you just? No, we were, we were, you know, so confused, and you know, I don't even know what I was doing. You know, nobody was. Do you, do you think it was self? We never, we never had anything like that happen, right? Before or since, you know, and it was, it was, it was terrible. Do you think there was a cover-up at all? I mean, we did interviews with, like, Tony Atlas and Savio Vega, and they said that uh, the office covered up the uh, actual murder. And I mean, do you, do you think there was a cover-up at no, all? No, we've not. 
the only guy that could have covered was Javik and I, and, and we didn't do that. Right. You know, we told the, the judge and the, in the courtroom, we said what, what really, what we saw, we didn't really, because I didn't see any stabbing, I didn't see any weapon, I didn't see anything. Do you think it was a, a case of self-defense? Do you think that, I mean, obviously, uh, Jose Gonzalez said that, you know, self-defense. Do you believe it was really self-defense? Well, I don't know, really, I don't know. You know, I respect the, the law. Right. Dutch Mattel said that um, when we did an interview with Dutch, he claimed that he didn't receive receive his subpoena, I guess, until the day after the trial had ended. Do you, do you believe that? or? I don't know, really. I don't know. Cause I don't know. Well, after but the, the trial, that was a long time after it happened. Right. So right. he must have received it before. I don't know. How bad did that affect your business, that entire incident? Because, I mean, that was, you know, Gonzalez. It, 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 it affected tremendously. You know, in a negative way because you know, right. a lot of fans, you know, stop going because they figure, well, this is too much. You know. Did a lot of the American guys that you booked? I know Abby was one of them. Tony Alice said they weren't going to work there anymore. How did you take that? Did you take it as a personal insult, or did you? Did no, you they it? were. They were. I know they came back eventually. No, they came back right away. Almost, we had, you know, we kept running with the same. You know, the young brothers were there. They they were sad. We were all sad. You know, we lost a good friend. I'm just looking at my notes real quick. And a good talent, too, for us. The company does more than anybody. Right, right. Because he was a big draw for us. At what point did you um, say, all right, I, I'm going to either continue to, to work with uh, Jose Gonzalez or or not work with him? I mean, what, how did that decision come about for you to continue working with uh, Jose Gonzalez after that incident? Well, he, he, he when he came, you know, innocent, then we couldn't really hold that against him because, you know, we'd be being prejudiced. Right. You know. Um, years later, I don't know how true this is, did Gonzalez go on TV at all and brag about killing uh, Bruiser Brody like years later? Is that true? I don't know, but I doubt it. I don't think he's that kind of a guy. You know, nobody could, you know, shit. Right. I guess we'll, we'll move on now. But a lot of people say a lot of bad things about, you know, he's not the most popular guy anyway. Jose so a lot, of, a lot of, Yeah, so a lot of people, you know, they take this to, to, to really run him down, and, and it's sometimes unfair because, you know, they say things about him that aren't true. Right, right. Did you, uh, what was your contact with uh, his wife, Barbara? What did you say to her after the incident happened? I mean, oh, it was how tough emotional was that? Thing I mean, for me to really say, tough. very hard, yeah. Right. She stayed at my house with the kid. Right. Her wow. son. And... All right. Um, after that had happened, I believe in 2005, you had the uh, Bruiser Brody Memorial Cup. Do you, do you think that was in poor taste for the company to promote it as the Bruiser Brody Memorial Show? Or? No, because uh, he was uh, one of our great stars. Okay. Like we have the Abdullah Memorial, and we have, you know. Right, right. All right. How did you feel, I believe, in 1991? Uh, Onita, he, he did the uh, FMW angle where they did the stabbing with Victor Kionez and, and got Gonzalez, where uh, Gonzalez stabbed Onita in the stomach. Do you think that was done in poor taste, that angle? After I don't know, really. Happened? I I had nothing to do with that, and when I heard about it, I, I thought it was bullshit. You know? Bad business. Bad business, bad taste. That you don't do that. All right. Did you have heat at all with Victor Kionez at this point in time when he left the company? Because we'll, we'll talk about when he started IWC coming up. Um, when he went over to Japan and, and started the Wings, did you and Victor already have a falling out at all? Or No, no, no. He, you know, he wanted to become independent and, and do his own thing, and you know, right. he had the right to do that. Memories of uh, Hercules Ayala. You guys had uh, the very first fire match, I believe, in 1988. What are your memories of uh, working Hercules Ayala? Another big heel that you guys had. Big heel, yeah. He drew a lot of money for us for a lot of years. Good talent, good, good, good guy. And then, uh, like a lot of people, like I said earlier, you know, copied the style of your company. You were definitely a true pioneer in the business for some of the stuff you did uh, in, I guess, the late 90s. Uh, early 90s, I'm sorry. Onita did the fire match uh, in, in Japan, uh, an FMW. What are your, what are your thoughts on uh, FMW uh, copying your style, doing the fire matches? You think it's just flattering or? Yeah, it's flattering, yeah. He, because here, you, we don't know anything, you know, like, say somebody copy his move, that move, you know. Nobody owns anything. Everybody can do what they want to do, you know. Right. But, but I'm flattered that they, you know, they mentioned that they got it from us. Memories of working with the uh, Iron Sheik when he would come into the territory. He was another guy close to Abdullah as far as getting over quick, you know. When we brought him over, he, uh, I guess he was over from the TV in WWF. Right. 
Easy to work with? Easy to work with, yeah. Crazy outside. Right? Crazy, right. yeah, yeah. Crazy uh, as hell, but... Yeah, do a lot good of box off is an attraction. Manny Fernandez, what are your memories of uh, the bull? Manny Fernandez? Oh, well, he was a little difficult, yeah, at times. Just ego purposes or? No, just yeah, problem, personal problem. But, okay. you know, basically a good guy. You guys did the uh, infamous angle where uh, Manny jumped off the top rope onto Invader's stomach and uh, Invader drank all the goat's blood and coughed up the blood. How awesome was that for your uh, TV for uh, box office? That, that, that was a little too strong. We got. You got in trouble for that? Bad publicity, yeah, yeah. What, what happened? Well, you know, on TV, it's a little strong for TV. Did you get kicked off any stations or? No, no, but uh, we got a memo. You got to eat. <laughs> All right, we were talking about uh, Manny Fernandez and him working for you. You said he was a little difficult to work with at times. Um, after Manny Fernandez came in, you uh, had other guys come in as well, like uh, Yokozuna. He came in for a little bit. Coquina? Yeah, yeah, Coquina, yeah. F a few times, yeah. Easy to work with? Uh, good yeah. Good wrestler? Yeah, good wrestler, yeah. Alpha and Sika were pretty much family yeah. members, so you worked yeah. with them a lot. For a long time, yeah. So you know, like, the family history there. Yeah. Uh, what are your memories of uh, Steve DeSalvo, Steve Strong? Hard to work with. Why is Very that? Difficult. A lot of people say he was a nightmare to work with. Yeah, he was. It was worse than that. <laughs> just what was? It? What do you think? He's just so difficult, you know. Um, in the, I guess in the late '80s and early '90s, your your business started to go downhill a little bit with the gate. Why do you? Uh, what was that? In, in, I guess the very late '80s, early '90s was, was business bad for you guys. No, no, it was a good late '80s. We set records. Uh, it was in the mid nineties. Mid nineties, to you know, the end of the nineties. What do you think uh, happened? What, what made the business change? Uh, it was a number of things. You know, mainly you know I was getting older and getting out of the business, and so it was time to pretty much bring in new guys. And yeah, that's when you brought in uh, TNT, Savio Vega, Miguel Perez Jr., Hurricane Castillo, and no, they came before. They were in already the before, yeah. Savio was big for us. Well, you know. He was, yeah. I was going to ask you. Let's talk about not Miguel. Miguel was just so so, but Savio was big. Talk about Savio Vega. We did an interview with him, and he talked about how he got to start with you and uh, his character. We taught him everything. He was a security guard, right? And we we made him a wrestler and turned him into a big star. And obviously, uh, later on down the line, we gave him his character, everything. Right, right. His name, his pain, everything. So you saw the big potential in TNT and his whole gimmick, and early on. Not so much in him, in in the gimmick. You know, the the ninja was hot. Right. That 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 thing, you know. So we figured, well, let's try it with him because he was a legit karate guy. Right. Black belt. So we figured, well, let's try him, and it worked. What about uh, Miguel Perez Jr.? Some of your memories of uh. No, no, we never. He worked for us, but he was, you know, just an up and down guy. What about uh, Hurricane Castillo Jr.? Same thing, you know. Yeah. Jose Estrada Jr.? Uh, so he didn't work for us too much, you know, just a little bit. His other brother, Julio. Right. Rico Suave, he worked for us a lot. He's, he's a good wrestler. Now, Savio, he also worked in the office for you, right? No, no. He never helped book it or no, run the didn't. locker room at all? No, he, just didn't strictly have, he, talent. he didn't have the ability for that. At least we didn't think so. Okay. What are, uh, I guess, uh, Hugh Osevanovich? One of your uh, announcers. What, yeah. are you, what are your memories of uh, working with Hugo? Great kid. We took him from, he was just a young wrestler doing jobs, you know? Right. And we saw the potential in him, and slowly we brought him up. First he was the manager, and he did a great job at that. Then we needed a commentator, and we turned him loose. Over the years, you know, back in the uh, 90s, he obviously uh, had some drug problems, um, what are, what are your thoughts on uh, his problems? Obviously, now he's back and clean and working for the WWE full-time. and He retired, I believe, recently, too. From yeah, guys. he did, yeah. Um, what are your memories of uh, Hugo as far as his problems? Did you uh, did you sense that at all when he was... No, I didn't. No, 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 because I don't get involved in their personal life, you know? Right. Nobody. Now, did you have any offers at all uh, to work for the WWF uh, in the 80s, the late 80s, or even the 90s? No, because I, I was too busy with my territory and... I wasn't going to, you know, give that up for nothing. How did your uh, appearance in the 1993 Royal Rumble come about? Oh, it's a good experience. I enjoyed it. What are your memories of that? Did Gorilla get you hooked up over there? Or? Yeah, Gorilla did, yeah. What are your memories of, uh, you know, working the, the Rumble? It was there? great. You know, I was there among a the whole bunch of, you know, big international stars. Right. At the time, it was, it was, it was, it was great. 
And I believe Grill Monsoon, even on commentary, put you over and he, he said that you're a youngster. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, you, you were like 45, I think, at the time, right? Uh, well, what year was that? I think it was 93, yeah. 93? Yeah, what was that? Eddie Gilbert, we talked about him uh, earlier on. He came in, I believe, and uh, around 95, right before his death. Um, was he booking at all, helping you do some of the storylines? Yeah, when he died, yeah, he was, he was, he was, he was helping out with the book. What are your memories of Eddie? Because I remember uh, right before that, he had called me to get some tapes. He wanted to watch fire matches because he was going to do a big fire match with you. And uh, I gave him a bunch of stuff. Um, what, what are your memories of uh, Eddie? He was very dedicated, you know, to the business. You know, he he lived for the business. What are your memories of his uh, I'm final very talented, match? huh? What, he had, I guess his final match was with a bear, a wrestling bear? Yeah. How, how did that come about? Good, good, good. He could, he could get anything over even dressing with a bear. What are your thoughts on uh, his passing? His, you know, on time sad, death? sad, sad. He's so young and so talented. Man. What was the uh, drug scene like in Puerto Rico? Is it a big drug scene? No, no. It's just uh... almost nothing now. Okay. What are your thoughts on uh, Victor Cunez and Savio Vega when they started uh, IWA Puerto Rico in 1999? And then they were pretty much running opposition to you guys. Um, talk about some of the uh, behind-the-scenes politics that happened there and, and, and the, the war that you guys pretty much had. Because you guys were both battling over you know, TV and, and towns. Um, what, are your, what are some of your memories that stand out? Well, like you said, it was a war, you know. Uh, we underestimated them, really, I didn't think. Uh, Dutch Mantel was the key. If Dutch Mantel hadn't gone there, they would have never succeeded. So you think Dutch pretty much helped them? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Okay. How much bad blood was there? At the it wasn't about blood. It was all business, you know. It was all business. I, yeah. Would you guys ever try to like sabotage? sabotage no, no, I never did. No, no, I never did. I don't believe in doing stuff like that. What was the? And uh, they know it too. Right. What was the big dispute that actually led to uh, Jose Gonzalez to jump from WWC to IWA? Because I mean, that was pretty big. I don't know. You're gonna have to ask him. Okay. <laughs> I'll never talk about that. He's working for me now. Right. He's back with you guys. Yeah. How big of an advantage was IWA's promotional relationship with the WWF at the time? Because they were working uh, very close with WWF. WWF would send them talent. WWE, I'm sorry, at the time would send them key guys. Did that hurt you at all, you think? Because they were getting, uh, like, the Tommy Dreamers would go down there. I know uh, Super Crazy Tajiri went down there a little bit. And uh, they would get other guys in there as well. Well, it, it helped them because, you know, the WWE had the TV there. You know, they, so... Right. Any, anytime you get talent like that, it's going to help you. What happened to your relationship with WWE at the time? Why, why weren't they sending talent to you guys? No, because at the time, Savio was working for them. Okay. So, you know. Right. Was a, how can you give somebody a talent and that, you know. Right. It was all business. He's like, now, now we're working with WWE and, and we get talent. From right. Them. It was just, you know. So And just before they got it, I was getting, I was getting talent from them. I but mean, it was just so that Savio was working for them at the time. Right. And I guess he, he saw the opportunity. He said, well, I'm here. So he talked to the bosses, and uh, he got him to send talent. How close did WWC come to going out of business at its lowest point? Was there ever a time where you said, all right, you know, houses are really down. Maybe it's time to pull a plug on the company at all? Or We never thought of that. Never, never, not once. We've gone through tough times, but we never, that idea had never crossed our mind. Victor claimed that he actually uh, loaned you guys money between 2002 and 2005 to keep you guys afloat. Is that true at all? Or? No, he's, he talked a lot of shit. So, right. You know, he's dead. But. What are your thoughts on Victor's passing with uh, Somas and all that? I don't know. I don't. You know, I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know he was taking that. All right. It's you not know, news to me. He, he's a good friend of ours. Um, as far as like his his lifestyle and and you know, it's no secret. You know, the stuff that went on behind the scenes with him and, and young workers. What, what are your thoughts on uh, all the allegations over the years that have come out with different guys saying, you know, Victor would try to sexually hit on them or, or stuff like that? Do you think it was uh, true or do you think it was bullshit? I don't know, really. I don't. You don't really. It's businesses. Yeah, I don't. It doesn't affect get you. Get so. in person and stuff like that. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Um, what, what is the current state right now in Puerto Rico uh, of the business? Do you yeah. think it will ever go back to the 80s? or? I don't know if we can go back to that because, you know, it was big then. Super big, but it's coming up, definitely coming up now. 
And Savio Vega, I believe, returned to you guys too last year, right? To, a, to work for you. A couple of just a couple shots, but that nothing, you know, nothing major. Um, did you ever want to be a heel? No. Always like being a baby face? Yeah, because it's what I know how to do best, so. Did you ever consider turning heel at all? No, never. No. Never have. All right. Um, I guess, how did you come about with the, uh, your signature cartwheel spot? When, when did you first start doing it? Oh, I don't remember. When I first started in Puerto Rico. How many times have you held the uh, WWC Universal Heavyweight title? They say 26 times. It's so many, I don't know. I was going to ask you, it was about 26. 26 times. All right. Let's talk about your sons, Carlito and Eddie, uh, Primo, both who have debuted in, uh, I believe, 1999. As kids, did they tell you that they wanted to get into the business? Did you always know that? No, no. They, they didn't say they didn't want to, but they never showed. Right. And I never thought they were going to follow my footsteps that way. And you also trained, uh, I believe, Orlando, who is now in WWE as uh, at the go. Uh, I I didn't really train him. He, he he was going to college in in Michigan. Right. In uh, Kalamazoo, I believe, Western Michigan, on a baseball scholarship. And while he was going there to study and play ball, in the afternoon when his time off, he would go and take classes. Wow. So at what point? Did Wrestling they classes, you know. What point did uh, Carlito come to you and say, "Hey, I want to, you know, get into the business"? And well, actually, it was Dutch Martel that got him in the business. Touched it with storyline, right? With Ray Gonzalez, right? Um, were you for that? I mean, did you ever try to say, "Hey, this is something that you don't want to get into"? Or? No, because I, you know, the business has been good to me, and I lost the business, you know. And the only thing I wanted them to go to college before they, if they were gonna do this full time, I wanted them to get an education first, just for back, and they did, yeah, right. yeah, right. Your daughter, I believe, her name's Stacy. Is she also? Uh, is she did it. She she likes it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, were you happy that uh, Carlito eventually got signed by WWE? Yeah. Right. Thanks to uh, Jerry Briscoe and I helped, you know, through Jerry, I helped getting in there. Right. No, you know, early on when he first came in, he was pretty outspoken about not getting a big push in the, in the company. Why, why do you think? Because when I first saw Carlito on TV, you know. He could talk, he, you know, he had the look. And uh, yeah. why do you think the, the office never really gave him the ball? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, no, I don't know. They have, they have their own way of doing business, you know. And right. You can't, I can't criticize them because they're, they're successful. So, But, you know, when you're in Rome, you do as the Romans do. Right. And if you don't like it, you get out. Did he ever call you uh, from the road and say, you know. No, hey, no, he's very, you know, he's very, keeps to himself and. I give him advice, but he never asks, you know, he keeps me out of it. Right. What are your memories of the, the 2005 uh, house show that you guys did? The angle with uh, Carlito and Ric Flair in, in San Juan, where Carlito spit the apple at, at your face and, you know, attacked you, and then Flair made the save. Yeah, that was good. Good stuff? Yeah, good stuff, yeah. The crowd eat it up? Or? Oh, tremendously. What are your thoughts on uh, Carlito's trouble WWE run? And, you know, eventually he was let go after failing the wellness test and uh, refused to go to rehab. What are your thoughts on, you know, all of that that, that, that went down? I mean... Well, it was, it was a mistake he made. And, you know, I wish he hadn't made it. But now he's he's over that. You know, he's in good shape. He's clean. And I'd like to see him go back to the WWE again. Do you think he will go back? I mean... I hope he does. I know if if he ever does and he gets the ball, he's going to take it home. Without a doubt. Yeah. What are your thoughts on our Primo and uh, Epico's current tag team title push right now? Very good, good, good tag team. They do, you know, they do a lot of good stuff. Do you think, you know, obviously WWE has always been obsessed with size and, and bigger guys. Do you, do you think it's uh, a miracle that you know they're giving those guys a push? No, but now size? if you notice, recently they 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 using a lot of smaller guys. Right. You saw that kid Aaron Bourne is very small, and our truth is not a giant, and neither is Kofi Kingston, and, and they 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 get a good push. Are you actually going to be at the show on Sunday, obviously? For yeah. Me? Yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about this. Uh, in 2001, was your brother murdered, Noel? Or yeah. What, what happened there? Was it a, just a, a bad incident? Well, he was, he was the president of the team service. And it was something, some problem he had in the organization with, you know, one of the members. And, you know, he was doing bad things. And my brother is straight, you know. And right, right. He, he wasn't going to allow, you know, monkey business in the union. And I guess 
disgruntled guy. Yeah, that's probably, you know, I don't know much of it, but from what I hear, that's really what took place. Does the guy go to jail, hopefully? Or? Oh, yeah, he's doing live without parole. Oh, good. How did you get involved with uh, boxing? Because you were involved in a controversial scoring of, I believe, Devin Alexander and the uh, HBO match. Lucas, uh, I don't want to mispronounce his last name, Matt Heiss. No. No? I don't know. I don't know what you get that sir. You never did any box? No. Okay. No, never. Okay. Well, a bad question. Where did you get that? I have no <laughs> idea. It was on, on my list of questions. He, no, he's the one that got it, right? Yeah. So, um, any thoughts on a possible introduction in the WWE Hall of Fame, excluding family? Uh, like, who, who would you want to choose? If you were to be, uh, you know, opted to be in the Hall of Fame for WWE, who would you want to uh, give the speech to induct you in, into the Hall of Fame? Oh, Carlino. Carlito? Definitely, yeah. If you couldn't have Carlito, who else would you want? Maybe Abby? <laughs> no, Abby is not a talking guy. You know, I, I don't know if you know. Like, he, through his career, he never spoke. Right, right. Because that's, that's not his strong point. Looking back at your career, what is your fondest memories? If you could have, like, uh, two matches to put on videotape to show your grandchildren, what, what matches would they be? It's hard because so many, really. Right. So many. Now that we have a few tapes, DVDs of, of my matches, and I watched some of them, and I didn't know they were that good. You know, I, right. I had some great ones, Hercules Ayala, many good ones with Abby, a few, quite a few with Ric Flair, too. You, you know, still watch the business today? Charlie Blanchard and I, but, you know, Humdingers. Right. Yeah. Garvin and I. Super matches. Dick Steinborn. But we don't have tape of that because it's right. way back. This time or I wrestled many hour matches. We had one 90 man match. All right, all right. That was, you know, classic. Looking back, um, who was the one guy you like to work with the most? Oh, I enjoy working with a lot of guys, you know, like I enjoy the funks a lot. Both of them, two different styles. But I enjoy both of them. Uh, Ronnie Garvin was solid, but I like working with him. Right. Flair, forget it. Harley Race, one of my favorites. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest misconception about the uh, Puerto Rico uh, wrestling scene? Is there anything you want to say to people that might be watching this? What do you mean misconception? Like, like you know, obviously there's a room with the fans being crazy. If there's anything that ever, you know, this is your time to say it, that you want to clear, clear the air um, and say, get off your chest. Something that people think that's true that might not be true. Like anything involving the Bruce Brody case or anything? Well, the Bruce Brody, they exaggerate a lot. They also exaggerate about the fans being as violent as they say they are. I admit, you know, they're pretty hot-blooded, but they're not, you know, murderers or assassins like, you know, some of these guys say they are. All right. Do you still watch uh, TNA at all? Do you ever watch uh, the kind I watch, of I watch, all, you know, not, not every week, but, you know, right. I watch it. What are your thoughts on uh, TNA's product? I think it's a good product, but I think it's lacking something. I, and I can't really pinpoint it. I like, sometimes I watch it, I like to be able to say, where well, is this right. that is missing? But I can't. You think but I know it's missing something. Because the talent, the roster is, is great, you know. It's as good as any. Right, exactly. But, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's missing something. Do you think the booking's bad there at all? I mean... No, some of the storylines are good. It's just, I don't know. If I ever remember, I call you and I'll tell you. But <laughs> has Carlito ever had any discussions about going to TNA at all during his time away? From no, he never showed an interest. I asked him. He said, ah. "Right." No. Do you follow MMA at all? Do you watch any? Uh, all A little bit. I, I, you know, it's too not an affection for me. Do you think UFC has hurt the wrestling business? No, I don't think so. No. It's two different things. Two different animals. Yeah. yeah. Right. Where Where do you see the wrestling business in the next five years? Do you think it's going to come back? Right now, obviously, it's a down period, and, and the business goes up and down in cycles. Yeah, it'll come up again. Yeah, right. Yeah, it'll, wrestling is goes in cycles. Who Who do you think the next big star is out there? Obviously, right now, you know John Cena's the top guy, and, and Randy Orton's. Who, who do you think is the next John Cena, or the next Hulk Hogan? I don't know to that level, but uh, Randy Orton is a tremendous performer. He's, he's great. Besides your, your family members, who are some guys that you like to watch on TV? Who are you a fan of today in, in, in the business? I like I like Randy. He's, he's good. For their work and all. You know, he, he reminds me of the our times, you know. Right. 
You also got another guy I didn't mention, Mr. Pogo. He came into the uh, the company. Pogo, he, he he drew big money for us. And Kendo Nagasaki. Kendo, yeah. What are your memories of uh, working with those two guys? Good. Good guys. Good guy, yeah. Um, in closing, I don't, I don't have any other questions. Do you have any questions you might want to ask? No. All right. In closing, is there anything you want to say to your fans out there that you never had a chance to say to until now? Well, uh, to keep uh, supporting wrestling, and you know, it's, it's a good form of entertainment. And uh, you know, we need them. The sport needs them to to continue and uh, to come back up to the level that it was in my country as well as in the states. Right, right. And all over the world, you know. Well, definitely, we want to thank you for being here today for this interview, and uh, hopefully, we'll be doing another one in another ten years or something with you. So, oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to hear about the Brody thing, I know. Here we go. Okay. So we were in a little spot show on Friday night, and Victor Quiones. Jose Gonzalez and Brody come in in Victor's Mercedes and they parked on the inside of the ball field. And we, me and uh, Spivey and a couple other guys and Dan were sitting in the dugout because you'd use the dugouts where you're, you know, where you go out to the ring. And we were sitting in there and Brody and had, it was his first night in the territory, had walked by him and Jose and, 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 and Brody turned to me and since nobody understood English, he says, I heard your wife's here. I says, yeah, Donna's here. I says, so are the girls. He said, hey, look, he says, we'll have to get together for a drink or for dinner or something. I said, okay. I says, how you doing? I says, how's, you know, Barbara, fine, everybody, Jeff, everybody's fine. That's good. I says, okay, big man. I says, I'll get a hold of you. He says, okay, I'll get a hold of you too. Boom. He goes in the other dressing room. So Saturday, we had a whole bunch of things to do because we had a big BAM on show. So there was no way that Brozier or none of us could get together. Well, I find out on the big BAM and show that Dutch is coming in to work against, uh, uh, against me. And um, him and Tony Atlas are going to work against me and Dan Crawford, which we knew about that a week before. But, you know, Dutch hadn't got in until that day. And so, you know, it was kind of a... Okay, good. This is gonna be fun, you know, whatever. And so anyhow, we we go into Bamon, I, and you always got there early because Bamon was such a bear to get into with all the people trying to get in early. And we're sitting in the dressing room, and there's and I'll tell you who was in the dressing room with me. It was uh, Abby was in there, Spivey, uh, Sika the Samoans, uh, myself, uh, Crawford. And there were a couple of the Puerto Rican guys. Chicky Star, Hercules, Ayala. We were all sitting there. And we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, one of the referees comes over, uh, Miguel. And they start talking to the other referee. And they hurried talk, like, you know, what the hell's going on? So Chiki had gone up to listen to the conversation, and they had walked away. So when Cheeky come back, I said, hey, Cheeky, what's going on? She says, I don't know. Something, something's going on, but I don't know what it is. I said, oh, okay. Well, a little while later, we heard an ambulance. I thought, fucking ambulance. Somebody must have got shot or, you know, Puerto Rico happens every day, you know. So the referee comes back again. They're in a conversation again. So Cheeky goes over and just butts in and says, hey, what's going on? So after they leave, Cheeky comes over and asks, Cheeky, what well, there were all of us for sitting there. I said, Chiki, what's going on? He says, oh, uh, they said that uh, one of the wrestlers uh, tripped in the dressing room and, and got cut on the porcelain sink, and they took him to the hospital. I said, well, who was that? You know, that's where he was either Dutch or or Tony or, you know, one of us, you right. know. And she says, oh, they didn't say who it was. And I says, hmm, that's awful fine. They didn't say who it was. So a little while later... Uh, Ron Starr was in the dressing room, too. So a little while later, they come back again, and they start talking again. Cheeky goes over and listens again. Cheeky comes over and says, hey, it was Brody. They said that Brody got in a fight in the dressing room, and that he fell against the porcelain sink and cut himself. I said, wait a minute. Big man get in a fight and fall against the porcelain sink and cut himself? Bullshit. Because a big man can fight. 
you know. So I says, uh, Cheeky, tell them we want to know what in hell's going on now. By now, everybody, all the guys are just, not just me, everybody wanted to know what was going on. So we went out to the dugout down below and looked across the, the, to the heel, baby face side. And I looked over there and Dutch was signaling me something and I couldn't figure out what he was signaling me. And I thought, what the hell's going on? And then there was just, there was Dutch and just a couple other guys in, dress, in the dugout. <laughs> Excuse me. And I thought, hmm. So me and Dutch, uh, me and Dutch, me and uh, Dan go back up into the dressing room and we're sitting there. Finally, Mateo comes over again. When he comes over again, I said, Cheeky, I said, you asked this piece of shit. What the hell's going on? I said, something's going on that we don't know about. And so then that's when they said that Brody had been stabbed. But they said he'd been stabbed by a fan. And I thought, well, why would they stab a baby face? You know? So I didn't think nothing of it. So we went to the ring. The match, we were like the third match. They put us on the third match. And Ron Starr was to wrestle against Jose Gonzalez that night, which he did wrestle against Jose. Jose wrestled him. Well, we went out in our match, and we got in our match. Tony Atlas just looked bad. You know what I mean? And Dutch looked physically shaken. And so I, we were sitting there getting the referee's instructions, and I says, what the hell's going on, guys? And Dutch looked me right in the eye, and he says, Jose stabbed Brody. I said, what? He said, Jose stabbed Brody, and Brody's in bad shape. I said, you're kidding me. Well, by now, the referee heard me and Dutch talking, and he tried to split it up. So when we started the match, it was me and Tony Atlas. And Tony Atlas and I locked up, and... Tony got a headlock and took me down. And when he took me down, he says, Frank's in trouble. I says, what do you mean? He says, he says, Bobby, when I took his boots off, his feet were blue. Well, anybody that knows anything about, that means he's lost a lot of blood. And I said, where's he at? They said, well, they find it. It took 45 minutes to get an ambulance, but they got him to the hospital. He said, I had to carry him out to the ambulance. I said, oh, Jesus. So anyhow, we, do it, we, we probably didn't go 10 minutes. And we get, got done. I went right back to the dressing room. I told all the guys in the dressing room. I said, look. I said, Brody got stabbed by Jose. That is from Tony and Dutch. And, boy, I mean, right away, everybody, Abby turned white. Believe it or not, Abby turned white. <laughs> Ron Starr said, if I got to work with Jose, check him for blades. And I'm not talking about razor blades. Check him for blades. <laughs> So we went, and I got right after I got showered and everything, I went back to my condo. And Dan come over with his girlfriend, and a couple of the other American guys come over to my condo. And we started talking. And I said, look, I said, where was Frank staying? They said, well, he was staying down in the Condado. And I said, okay. I said, I got to go down there. So I went down to the Condado, and Frank always carried a briefcase. I don't know if any, you ever knew that, but he always carried a briefcase. In that briefcase, Frank kept everything. His bank statements, his books. I mean, he, he worked, it was like a work briefcase, everything. And if he had pot, he had pot in there, drugs, whatever. I got the briefcase, took it back to my place, and in the, in the, in the ventilation vent of my condo, I put it in there because I wanted to make sure that it went to Barbara. I didn't want those people to get a hold of it. Who, you know, right. Because we thought right away, we thought that there was something pretty bad going on. So I went down to the bar with Dutch, and, or not Dutch, but uh, with Ron Starr and uh, Sika, and we waited. And, and they called us at about, I guess it was about, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning to say that he passed. And when he passed, they called us, and I told them, I asked them, I said, what, what, did, what did he die from? They said he had a, a ruptured liver. His liver was cut, and they couldn't stop the bleeding. So I went back to the condo, and I said, look, I told my wife. My wife was worried because, you know, she had known Frank since we were, you know, since we got married. 
And I told her, I says, Frank's died. I says, we don't know what's going on. I said, I think the best thing for you and the girls to get off this goddamn rock tonight. So she said, okay. So we packed all the girls and her stuff up while the girls slept. And I called the airport, 6.30 in the morning, they were on the first plane out of Puerto Rico. Well, we all went down afterwards to the hotel where everybody was staying. They were, had a big show booked in Mayawes that Sunday. It was sold out. And we all, the Puerto Rican wrestlers, the American wrestlers got together in the hotel and we said, bullshit, we're not going. You know, this is bullshit to kill somebody in this goddamn business. And what it was over, it was over taxes because Frank would not pay their bullshit taxes, okay? So don't, don't let it go around that it was over anything else. It was over the goddamn bullshit taxes. But to make a long story short, we got in a hotel, we all decided not to go. The Puerto Rican boys stood with the American boys. Uh, Castillo Jr., uh, uh, Miguel Perez, uh, Cheeky Star, uh, TNT, everybody stuck together. And they finally figured out that they had a problem. They, the cops came to the hotel. We called the cops to the hotel, the investigator. We said, we want this son of a bitch prosecuted. Has there any witnesses? Tony says, I'm a witness, but I'm scared. Sika stood up and said, I'll go with you, brother. And the cop looked at Sika and says, I don't think anybody's going to mess with him. So Sika went with Tony, Tony to make his statement, and the Youngbloods to make their statement. They actually saw it? They saw it, yeah. They were right there. It happened in, in, a, in a, shower. A, a shower room with the door closed. But they were right there when, they, when Brody staggered out and Jose tried to cut his throat. And they know who took the knife and got rid of the knife. Right, Victor Jovica, who got rid of the knife. Anything else you want to know about it? And believe me, ain't one of them Puerto Rican son of a bitches that can do a goddamn thing to me today. Because I live that goddamn hell all the time. What are your thoughts of the guys that went back to work for uh, the company? We had, they had nowhere else to go. I, I, was, I worked there. Do you think any of these guys up in the North United States, all these tough son of bitches that were going to go down there and revenge Brody and shit that never got on an airplane, do you think that they would have gave us a job? Shit, no. They didn't care. They like hearing their goddamn voice, but they didn't do a damn thing. At least the guys that stayed there tried to do something. We tried to get justice. We had no support. All these goddamn promoters and shit back here. Turn her back on everybody. You know why? Frank Brody was out for Frank Brody. But Frank was a truthful man. And I'm not saying Frank was the greatest guy in the world. Because believe me, Frank could be a prick. But you had to respect him. And the promoters didn't like him because he stuck up for himself. So they left him out to hang. The only reason is Jose was jealous. Number one, Brody was over more than he was. Number two, Brody was always going to be over more than he was. Number three was Brody wouldn't listen to him when he thought he was a big man on Puerto Rico and pay his goddamn taxes. He told him to go to hell and jam him up his ass. He told all three of them that. Jovica, Cologne, and Jose. Right. Peter. You were there the night that... Uh, yeah, that what, tragic night. What, what are your memories of what happened? Well, uh, it's something that... The that never gonna be out of my head because it's, it's something that I mean you got you got a friend got stabbed you know uh, I remember I always arrived the matches was starting at eight thirty uh, the guys arrived there sometimes seven o'clock seven thirty something like that I always was there earlier always about five thirty six o'clock because I was already in the dressing room, uh, mm -hmm. getting my corner, nice, fresh in myself. Then I start doing the paint. Uh, and I remember uh, they better call Frank to the to the showers to talk to him. Hey, you know, all the time, you know, you call the guy, hey, I need to talk to you. Every, everything was cafe big time at that time. I mean, big time. And uh, then that guy got happened, man. 
I mean, we. I remember Frank was in Puerto Rico for for four days, five days. I remember it was four days that we worked Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Then the Sunday uh, was canceled, of course. Uh, and they took they took him out of the the building uh, and the stretcher. And he was alive. He was talking, and they took him to the operation room. And next day, uh, I hear he he was bleed. Some I mean, probably cut something. What what, what is your understanding of what exactly happened between them? So I hear different stories. Oh, imagine what how many I hear. Uh, I hear the, the the Frank wasn't a good people. The Frank uh, got him better one time in uh, in New York, and uh, beat the hell out of him. Uh, that he changed a uh, finish here, that he hit it with a chair, the arguments, uh, that, that he told uh, Frank a few times, don't come in shorts. I mean, he's coming from the States to an island. So, of course, when you go there, you, the first thing you're thinking is potty. Hey, you know. So he went over there to work and make some money. And uh, I hear that, uh, you know, but in one point, I mean, he was a booker. They probably have something like you hear too a lot of people they have some something going on before and invader probably had that in his head all the time hammer him hammer him and phew, i mean that took the business and the company all the way to the bottom big time did you think that was going to be it for uh capital oh yeah at one point one point was i mean uh that i mean that's a that was uh First, first uh, page news, you know, wrestler died by, by by all the one, blah 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 blah. The trial after I don't know, I don't, I can't, I don't have the, the the how many months later, but the trial was uh, pretty good. Uh, you know, they they supposed to they canceled uh, uh, the trial so many times because they uh, they can get to the John Bloods, they can get to Dodge, they can get to Tony Atlas. Uh, too much bullshit, you know, and the point in where uh, the only people that went to, to testify was Carlos Chubica and me. Right. You know, and uh, of course, I'm not gonna change, I never change, and I, and I never will. Uh, changed my, my, my side of the story, what the police asked me the night of uh, what happened. And uh, when you go into court, they give you the paper. Hey, remember you say this, uh, the prosecutor? I read everything. Yeah, I remember all this. So, well, I'm going to ask you the same. Go ahead. You ask me, I answer what I see. You know, what I don't see, I can, of course, I'm not going to make, you know, I'm not going to get myself in trouble. So we talk, and I remember... Uh, the prosecutor making you know the questions about what clothing he have and stuff like that. Uh, his uh, lawyer was asking me a few things, stuff too, and uh, I finished one. I remember one of the times that we went there. I got probably mental. Mentally, I was uh, uh, getting. I mean that that stuff there. Uh, to be there to to leave that moment make you make you think of a lot of a lot of stuff i come in one time from uh ponce area by myself and i was in plaza las americas turning to going home and uh here come this song in the in the radio oh what's the cd or something like that whatever the point was i i just start crying i mean i, I was holding that inside of me and I start crying. I went from the left lane coming out of the exit to the right lane all the way to the to the shoulder. I didn't even stop and even look back. I can't even see. I was so I mean I was crying big time. I put to the side and start crying, crying, crying. Then I come down, you know, talk to my wife uh, by that time by the phone and, and she said calm down, blah blah blah. Then I drove home and all right, one of the time one of the time that I that I wouldn't say this. I was uh, in a try. They canceled the try. Was about noon. I remember uh, they canceled the try in the morning. It was about noon when I arrived at my house. Was hot. I mean, Puerto Rico was it was hot. I remember I was cold, big time. And I was shaking. I mean, 
uh, probably mentally uh, exhausted because what happened and, and all this, all that stupid stuff. Uh, I remember I was in my bed with the, with the blankets covering me because I was cold. I feel cold and I was shaking, you know, whatever. I was, was scared. Uh, but later, I, you know, fell asleep and wake up okay. Uh, of course, or, uh, in better when uh, they find him no guilty, you know. And uh, then later one time, I was in uh, with Chiki. We promoting the other company that, that I left with uh, uh, Hugo. And uh, and this guy, the, the the DJ, he started asking us questions, and uh, the same thing. What happened? What do you think? And I, I mean. I say the same thing. Yeah, something happened between these two. And uh, of course, I mean, the story is that the Brody have uh, uh, the knife, the Inver have the knife, the, 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 the towel, and mm. ah, so many, so many stupid stuff. Uh, and uh, Inver sued me for $1 million because I say in the radio that he was, he killed uh, uh, Brody. And uh, I said, well, that, that never went nowhere. I said, well, I, I say what I see. You know, I cannot change the, I wish I could change the story, you know, on, on that night or that afternoon. And, uh, but after that, uh, I didn't even talk to him better. After I left the company, I didn't even talk to him in, wow, years. Very intelligent man. All right, very intelligent. Uh... See, I didn't know Bruiser that well. See, I met him. I met him in San Antonio. Whenever I went down there for a couple, of, I went down. I only went down there for like a month or so. I met him there. Met his wife, and then I met him here in Puerto Rico. So, and I've been asking about this so many times. You know, what happened to Bruiser Brody? What happened to him here? And the answer to that, and I'm not dodging and I'm not ducking, but I don't know what happened. I don't know what caused it. I don't know what precipit uh, uh, preceded it. So let's start back from the beginning. I met him here, and I remember I told him that we used to stay. This is where we're sitting at right now. It's called East Laverde. It's right next to the airport. And there's another little tier section down the way. It's called Condado. And I had a, a nice hotel set up down there, and they give the, the, give the restaurants a you know, discount right. rate or whatever. And it's a nice place. And I remember me and Tony Atlas and uh, Brody, we were staying there. Because I told them about it. And uh, the only time I ever talked to Brody at length, really about a lot of things, even not just talked to him for more than like five minutes, was the day all this happened. And we was down in a, a hotel lobby, was waiting for Atlas. Atlas had a guy from the gym, he was a big fan, and he would take us to the match. So it was me and Brody and Atlas, and we went to the stadium that day. And, uh, very unfortunate what happened. And I have, I have written an uh, account of this. It's on the internet. It's probably be on the internet to the end of time anyway. And uh, do you remember uh, maybe two months ago? There was a report. There was a report. In a Japanese magazine. In a Japanese magazine that I had said or that I had been quoted as doing this interview, which I never did an interview. I don't know who this guy is, a Japanese guy. Uh, that he said, that I said, that Carlos Colon and Victor Javica had paid a bribe of $225,000 to conceal evidence in the Bruiser Brody mur murder case, which is just an out-and-out -out lie. It never happened. I never did an interview. I never said anything like that. And even if I did say anything like that, first of all, if anybody knows Victor Javica, that tight son of a bitch, he wouldn't give $225,000 for himself, let alone somebody else. <laughs> And the only other erroneous part of that is to conceal evidence in the case in which there was no evidence to conceal. The, que the, the dispute was not over, did he do it? It's why he did it. Right. See, he admitted doing it. The invader admitted he was the cause of it. Do you think it has anything to do with money laundering? Or? No. No? Nah, shit, no. It had nothing to do with that. Was that a rumor? I heard that was one of them. It was like a million rumors. Nah. In your I, heart, what do you believe? What, what do you I believe? believe in my heart that Brody and Invader had had trouble previously. 
but it was like forgotten. What uh, kind of trouble? Well, Brody beat him up in the ring. Right. You know, but see, Brody beat a lot of people up in the ring. You know, that was the way he worked. You know, he just beat the dog shit out of you. Which is why I sort of like wrestling because, you know, somebody beats the shit up, but the hell just give up, just quit. Right. You know, but, but I don't know if that was a problem, but I think Brody had bought into this company. You know, Gorilla Monsoon, I think, had owned some stock here at one time. Right. And somehow, Victor Keonis was involved in this, that he, he took the stock from Monsoon, and I think Victor Keonis and Roger Brody were like big buddies. And what I think happened, and I never, and I can't confirm this, but I think Brody had somehow had a percentage of this company here in Puerto Rico. And the invader was in a position to where he was in a, like either a booking position or a, he owned part of the company or something. And that's where the clash came. So to me, he was a very, I don't know what, no. then again, I don't know why it happened. I, I'm just sorry that it did happen. A very unfortunate day very tragic day, and I think probably the most infamous day in the history of wrestling. Is, far it, as, is it hard coming back here to work for the same promotion and, and see the guy in the dressing room at the stab party? Well, see, then again, see, I don't know why it happened. All right. You know? Basically, I have very little to do with the guy. All right. If I don't have if I don't have business with him, I just don't see him. All right. See, I'm in one dressing room, he's in the other dressing room. See, the way it's, see, I do my thing, he does his, I don't wrestle him. Right. I don't wrestle him. So Is that one of the rules that you won't work with him, or? That's my rule. Right. It's not my rule that I won't work, work with him. It's my rule that I prefer. Right. You know, and they understand that, you know. How hard was that for you when you, when you heard about that? That, when I first, you know, when I first heard about it, I was leaving Tokyo, Japan to go to Okinawa. We were in the airport in Tokyo at Masala Tori, who I knew as the manager of Killer Khan when I started in Florida. Right. And I had great matches with Killer Khan and Hattori. And Hattori would come up to me. You got to remember, Japanese people don't say everything right out. Right. So uh, um, he comes up to me. He said, Manny-san, Bruce Brody gone. I said, okay, cool. Huh. And I said, no, Manny-san, Bruce Brody gone. I said, Hattori, cool. Gone where? Right. I don't know, Manny-san, gone. I said, dude, what are you trying to tell me? What do you mean, gone? Oh, Puerto Rico. Jose Gonzalez had said, are you talking to me dead? I said, yeah, gone. And I was like, I was stunned. I was like, no way, dude. You got to be either joking, right. which is a horrible joke, stupid joke. I said, no, this, this just can't happen. I mean, this isn't going on. So it just, it, it, it shocked me. Right. He told me, and the way I was told to it, you know, that he's gone. Right. I was like, okay, he's gone. I didn't know he was telling me that he was dead. Steve wants to know the difference between uh, Carlos and Vader and Victor Javica. They're all the same. They're all the same. You got one white, you got one uh, Puerto Rican, and you got another Puerto Rican who's the same. You still friendly with Victor at all? Sure. I got nothing against nobody. Right. How hard was it for you to go back there after the whole Brody thing? Was it like kind of hard to go back or? Because I know for a while you didn't want to go back to the island. Who told you that? It's just uh, Victor. We're good friends just with Victor. Just in the magazines yeah. too. We talked to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> That's news to me. Now Victor was telling us, we went down there a couple of times and he says, you know, that you didn't want to go back after that whole incident. But eventually you went back. Were you nervous at all or no? Nervous about what? Just in case, in case what? any funny business were to go on down there. What kind of funny business? That uh, was all personal. Well, what happened? Just with the whole incident with that uh, with Brody, Brody and, in the shower. Oh, I don't know nothing about that. All right. It must be something what you know and I don't know. What happened? I heard a lot of different things you want to say or no? no I don't know what uh, happened. You know, you're this, saying. The story that I heard, the well, whole. There's two different stories. I heard that. Back in the 70s when Brody was working for Vince Sr., uh, I guess Invader was up there doing jobs or whatever, and Brody was a bully or, or took liberties with him in the ring. Also, uh, I guess when it came time to work down in Puerto Rico, now, you know, Invader had power down there. And he, he had was, the buck. Right. I guess it was... And Brody was going to stand up to him and, and 
motivator belt that I got to stand up for myself. And then one thing led to another, and Brody was going to punk him in front of all the locker room. That's the the building's around here, so I don't know. Wherever you, if you see I want to eat some place. Give me a decent place, please. Okay. There's got to be a Chinese restaurant around I'm here. I don't know Chinese what food. Really? Like and you got a steak or something or what? We'll drive. We'll find something. Please don't take me in the ghetto. There's McDonald's? No. <laughs> <laughs> you got any smoke meat around here? What are your thoughts on the uh, Bruiser Brody murder? I don't know if I want to go there. It, uh, we just did an uh, interview with uh, Savia Vega. He told us his, you know, his whole entire take on it. Right. <clears throat> like I say, I, I wasn't there. I only know what people have told me. Uh, Brody was a buddy of mine. Uh, Jose was a, a semi buddy of mine. Uh, it, and in no way am I defending Jose, okay? No way am I defending because what happened was wrong. But being in the office, Jose used to not beg, but plead. Please don't book me with Brody. He hurts me. He hurts me. He hurts me. Uh, numerous times I have seen uh, whelps on Jose that uh, where Brody hit him with a boot, hit him with a chair, and bruises and whelps the next day. Uh, Brody laughing, laughing to me about it. Uh, but you have to, you know, that that's Jose's part there, and you have to understand that's Bruiser Brody's style uh, is to knock the shit out of you. Uh, the old style where you make it look real. Uh, Jose didn't like that. Why the two couldn't have got together and said, uh, you know, hey, hey uh, you're hurting me. Let's don't do this. Let's don't do that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, a lot of people didn't like to work with Brody because of that reason, because he was a tough son of a gun. Uh, and, you know, he was a tough son of a gun in wrestling. And if God help you, if you had to fight him in the street, hmm. uh, because you would have, you know, I don't know if you could have stopped him, but... That was Brody's style. That style had sold out St. Louis and Kansas City and Texas. and uh, So <clears throat> there's more to the story of Brody and Gonzalez than that night. This is something that built and built and built and built and uh, happened in a very, if, if it happened the way I heard it happen from somebody, Happened in a very chicken shittish way, Jose. But I wasn't there. So, you know, it's hard to comment on it. But I know it wasn't just that night. Uh, because, you know, I'm talking two years. Uh, I hadn't been there for two years when, you know, I, then this happened. So this is something that had built up over the years. Did that, you ever hear uh, anything about when, uh, I guess, they were working for Vince Senior? When Jose came in to do jobs that he worked a little bit with Frank back then and same stuff happened back then? No. Okay. No, no. I don't know. Wasn't, uh, wasn't there, never worked for Vince. Okay. Right. Uh, for Carlos and right. uh, Victor, what are your memories of uh, that promotion down there in, uh, in Puerto Rico? Well, my best memory is Brody walking in the shower and coming out with his guts hanging out. Well, I'm going to talk all about that. That's, that's my best memory of, of, of Puerto Rico, of him getting stabbed to death there, you know? What exactly happened in your, we've done interviews with Savio Vega, I've done interviews with Dutch Mantel, uh, and uh, a couple of other guys that were in the locker room at the point in time when it happened. Uh, Bobby Jaggers talked to us. What, are, what is your view on uh, what happened with Bruce I don't Brown? have a view. You know what happened. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I don't have a view. Well, Brody was sitting there on the steps of the Tatamount. And I came out and I asked Bill, and I said, you need a ride. He said, well, Jose's supposed to pick me up. They rode together the night before. Then I said, well, you can ride with us if you want. And I had a buddy that works at the gym to call the Monster uh, Muscle Factory. So him and his wife came to pick me up, and Brody, myself, and Dutch Mantel, we got into the car. Me and Dutch sat in the back, and uh, Brody and uh, uh, 
our, our broad is set up front. Um, and and uh, uh, my buddy wife sat in between Brody and him. We got to the building. I was sitting there. I was doing a, a portrait of, of Mark and Jay Youngblood. And Brody come over and said, oh, that's good, Tony. I didn't know you could draw like that. That looked just like them guy. He said, can you do a picture of my kid for me? So I said, yeah, uh, give me a picture of your kid. When I said that, uh, Jose came back and said, Brody, can I see you? So they went in the shower. And they walk in the shower. All I hear was, huh, huh. So I jumped up because I was about as far from here to you from the shower. I dropped my art pad. And I saw Jose, Brody bending over, holding his stomach. Jose had a knife like this. Carlos Colon cut in front of me, grabbed Jose by the arm, pushed Jose up against the wall, said, no, Jose, no, Jose. Jose come down with the knife, cut Brody's ponytail off. I pulled Brody out of the shower. I laid him down on the floor. Now, we waited for the ambulance. Now, I, as I was there waiting for the ambulance, the thing that shocked me the most was the guys getting dressed for the show. That was the most shocking thing to me. So then the, the, the guy couldn't lift Brody. He said, can, can anybody help me lift him? And I said, I can lift him. So I go to pick up Brody. Brody said, don't, don't drop me, brother. I said, brother, I, I, I curl more than what you weigh. So I sent him in the thing. And the ladies and the man said, if somebody want to go with him, they can go with him. So I got on the ambulance. And I figured as I jumped on the ambulance that I couldn't, you know, I don't speak Spanish. So I, I have a buddy of mine that spoke Spanish. So I reached out to the car. I was pretty powerful back in my young days. I grabbed him by the back of his shirt and I drug him behind the ambulance until he was able to pull himself in the ambulance. I went to the hospital. So I sat there with Brody for a while and I, the doctor finally came in and looked at him. And I sat there while they took him in the operating room. So the guy come back out and tell me, he said, we got him stable. So then I left and went back to the building. When I walk into the building, all I hear was laughing and joking. Patting each other on the back, talking about what a great match they had, how wonderful this was, how wonderful that is. And I'm standing at the door, I said, a man just got stabbed in here. And everybody's acting like nothing happened. So this policeman's coming over and he said, uh, it's a shame what happened to your friend. I said, yeah. And he said, did y'all get a look at it? I said, look at who? And they said, the fan that did it. I said, didn't no fan stab that man? He said, well, who stabbed him? I said, that man sitting right there. He said, you mean Vader? I said, yeah, he the one that stabbed him. So then one thing led, led to another. And so the police went around and asked other people, what did they see? Everybody in the dress room was bland. Nobody saw nothing but Tony Atlas. That's why every time Brody name come up, who name come up with it? Because I was the only one that spoke up for him. And then many people that spoke to me and his friend, he couldn't find one person to speak up for him that night. I was the only person to speak up for that man that night. And I'm the one that got all the blame for it and everything for sticking my nose in it. So I was married to a Puerto Rican girl at the time, so I called her and told her what happened. And she said, well, I sure hope you keep your mouth shut and not say nothing. I said, well, it's too late. I just told the police what happened. She said, well, you better get the hell out of there. So the next day, Abdullah called a meeting. So he said, well, I, Abdullah said, well, I can't go down there. I'm, you know, because the heel and baby face didn't dress together. He said, he said, you got to go, Tony. He said, because uh, uh, I didn't see what happened. He said, you know, he said, he said, you guys are the only one that saw what happened. So I said, I go down if somebody go down with me. So Sika. So I go with you. So to the Sika, police station you're talking To about. the police station, okay. yeah. So Seeker took me down, walked down to the police station. So I told him what happened. When I got back to the dressing room, Sabio Vega said, you better leave, Tony, because you're running your mouth and they're coming after you. So I went to the airport, sat at the airport all night, caught the next flight out the next day. Did you ever go back to the island? I went back about two months ago for his anniversary show. What was that like? A little nervous. But uh, they told me that they're going to contact me for the trial. I never hear any more about it. Why do you think uh, Jose got off? There was no witnesses. I was the only, I was the only person that, that would speak up. And that when I didn't show up, that was pretty much, uh, pretty much the end of it. Why do you think they never called you to testify? 
you think they paid off or? I thought they didn't want me getting killed. I would have never testified. You know that. Right. How far do you think I would have made it to that courthouse? You would have killed. I would have been killed. Right. And I don't think the cop wanted another death on the head. I wouldn't be here telling the story if I went back there. Did you ever run into the invader again, Jose? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But that wasn't between me and it was just, just I saw something. Like if I see something happen to you, you know, like I said, I'm from the hills of Virginia. And us old Virginia bridge runners, I just can't sit back and watch something happen to you and then sit back and, you know, and not say nothing about it. Or act like I don't know what's going on. I can't do that. And it's not in me. I wasn't raised that way. What What did uh, Invader say to you when you guys ran into each other again? Nothing. Totally quiet. Yeah, yeah it was like, you know. We just talk about old age, talk about Raska, you know. Wow. Yeah. That's a crazy story. Yeah. Huh. Did uh did other guys did you ever like look it down on them for going back? Like I know a lot of guys said they weren't gonna go back and work for the territory and no. a lot of guys went back No, earlier. because that's the rest of the business. Right. You don't have friends in rest, you have business associates. If you leave this business you got two friends or one friend, consider yourself lucky. Wrestlers have never been each other friends. We've been each other business associate. It's true. You know. And if we could cut one of the other guy's throat and cost him a, his career, we'd do it in a heartbeat. Hmm. Do you want to say anything else about the uh, Bruiser Brody murder? Or no, no, no. I, I just wish that it never happened. That's, you know, it was a horrible, horrible uh, uh, thing. And what it did, it destroyed everything we loved about Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was like a paid vacation. And it was so many wonderful, wonderful memories for many, many wrestlers. So many great stars got their career there. And when that incident happened, it just took it all away. Why, why do you think the incident even happened in the first place? I mean, I've heard different stories what the reasoning was. What, what did you hear? Nobody even know. Okay. It, it'd be very hard to, to speculate, you know, because what happened between them two, the only one we really know is Jose and Brody. Okay. It, there was no argument or nothing. Right. There was nothing. He walked in. Jose said, can I talk to you? Brody said, yeah. He walked in the shower. He got stabbed. It was just that simple. There was no argument, no fussing, no shouting, no nothing. Hmm. There was nothing to show why or where.